Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? And welcome to the second session of the intellectual seerah. And what we're going to be trying to do in these sessions is we're trying to employ what is referred to as the multidisciplinary approach, an interdisciplinary approach. We're not just dealing with one thing. We're dealing with many different things. We're trying to bring the philosophical discussions or historical discussions, manuscript discussions, psychological discussions, sociological discussions, and of course, the Islamic science discussion as well. We're trying to kind of merge them all together because quite frankly, this is the only way in the modern age, we can crank, try and create an original seerah. I mean, seerahs have been done, have been taught for 1,400 years now. They've been taught and uh, in many different ways. And we have to use what is to our disposal or at our disposal in order to try and create something quite novel. Why? Number one, because this is what knowledge production is all about. If you want to say something new or bring something new, then you have to try and bring all the information that you have of the day. Number two is because that creates a tighter level of relevance makes it relevant to the people in the 21st century. So usually what we do, uh, or what we would be doing here, is talking about what is referred to, our, or what are referred to as the Shama'il of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or uh, really the, the, the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are two kinds of characteristics. There is what is referred to as al-sifat al-khalqiyya, and, or al-khilqiyya, and then al-khulqiyya which is the, you could say, the, the natural characteristics of his actual physical self. And then you have his actual, you could say, um, etiquettes or his virtues. So we're going to be going through two different things. But of course, before we do that, we're going to start in a typical manner and deal with the question of beauty itself. Now, why is this question important? It's important because if we're talking about the fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has beauty both in character and in physical appearance and it makes sense to ask the question is beauty a thing of course many of you may have heard the phrase beauty is in the eye of the beholder beauty is in the eye of the beholder but is this something which is true um, actually there was a raging discussion in the 18th century between some of the philosophers about this very question and uh, two people in particular stand out uh, who represent what's referred to as the sentimentalist school or the subjectivist school, and that is uh, David Hume and Immanuel Kant. Now, these two individuals basically belong to a camp called the subjectivist camp. They said that beauty is not a thing out there that you can measure, and therefore it's not objective in that sense. And we are imposing our own sense of kind of aesthetic taste or value judgment onto the object rather than the opposite. But this was not always the belief system. So, for example, historically, uh, Aristotle and Plato believed that beauty was a thing objectively measured. So beauty or aesthetics is sometimes analogized with morality and sometimes it's an analogized with mathematics. And what Aristotle said is that, look, I mean, there are some aspects of beauty which can be measured. Uh, proportionality, geometric design, symmetry and so on. And you'll find that this has cross-cultural application. We'll go through that in a second. But this debate between objectivists and subjectivists is important because if we say that we believe that, for example, that the Prophet Muhammad is beautiful in both character and physical appearance, is this a, is this a claim which is a subjective claim? Because if it is, then it's, it's a very difficult claim to make. I use it as proof of the veracity of Islam. If it's, the whole thing is relative and subjective, then how can it be used as proof for the veracity of Islam? Whereas if we can say that at least it maintains a degree of objectivity, then it can actually be used as an evidence for the veracity of Islam. And this is important because the Quran says, لَمْ يَكُنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ كِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِينَ حَتَّى تَأْتِيَمُ الْبَيَّنَ رَسُولٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ يَتْلُوُ صُحَفُ مَطَهَرَ That the, the people of the book were differing until the bayana came, the evidence. And the evidence is Rasul مِنَ اللَّهِ Actually, he's the evidence himself. The Prophet Muhammad is an evidence in chapter 98 of the Quran for the veracity of Islam. That's something which the Quran hints to and indicates to. So let's get started with it. So we said here that, yes, I mean, look, Plato and Aristotle and Hellenistic kind of philosophers, they would, they would point to things like mathematical forms and they would say that these mathematical forms are indication that beauty could, at least to some extent, be measured. And this actual uh, idea, it persisted in the Western philosophical tradition to the Renaissance. And obviously people like Michelangelo and... Uh, and others, you know, they, they believed in that. They believed that beauty was something you can you can kind of measure and it's something that's quantifiable. But as I mentioned, that changed with Locke, Kant and Hume. 
who all uh, belong to the subjectivist camp. And uh, David Hume says uh, very clearly, beauty exists merely in the mind. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you've heard that expre uh, expression before. Nowadays, we're actually finding new evidence, a new layer of evidence after this philosophical discussion, which indicates to the cross-cultural relevance of beauty. Now, it's not the case that everything that is cross-cultural, that exists in many cultures independently, historically and contemporaneously, is true as an objective value, but it's more information or it's more indication that it may be, right? So, for example, there was one particular study, or there are actually many studies to this effect. I've, I've quoted only one here just because of brevity and conciseness, which is the idea of symmetry as beauty enjoys cross-cultural support. So this Bode and Hilmi, a cross-cultural comparison for preferences of symmetry. When we say cross-cultural, we're talking, if you go to this culture and this culture and this culture and that culture, then most cultures would, in, would show you Okay, that uh, you know, something which is symmetrical, something which enjoys that level of symmetry, proportionality, is conceived as beautiful by the end user. And that's why you'll find in most things which, most products or most designs which uh, capture the most attention, they are actually symmetrical. So like we're talking about architecture, for example, some of the architectural designs which are most prominent are geometrically symmetrical. For example, mentioned for you know the Andalusian. Uh, if you look at the Islamic, it was referred to as Islamic architecture, but even Gothic architecture, even brut brutalist, maybe not <laughs> to the same extent, because it's uh, actually brutalism. We were talking about it before. Is the reason why it's uh, it's like that is because functionality had been emphasised rather than uh, aesthetics because of this view. We're, I mean, think about it: the 18th and 19th century, people were saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, let's focus on let's focus on in fact not beauty but let's focus on function so they give us an, a, a building in the united kingdom which is meant to be a first world country which looks quite horrendous comparative to what people were actually able to produce in this country hundreds of years mm -hmm. ago go to westminster abbey like for example and and just think um, use your own sense of taste look at the architecture there and then compare it with one of the you know council blocks or whatever and see the difference there it's like there is a degeneration in uh, our conceptions of beauty, and it's, it's actually due to this, if you like, almost postmodernist idea that every, everything is subjective, there's no level of beauty and this kind of thing. So they're destroying the landscape, not just uh, morality. And so, you know, in many ways, and we'll come to this, and you'll see this when we talk about virtue ethics, and it's very important as well. In many ways, the West has actually gone down, in many ways. Uh, it's gone up in technology and science, there's no doubt about that, but it's, when it comes to conceptions of beauty and morality, you can see, you can see a degeneration in that because of some of the belief systems that have come about, which are of an atheistic kind. But humans have a sense of aesthetic taste. And this, is, by the way, is categorized in different ways. Like, for example, people watch sports now, for example. People watch football. People watch, like, soccer, if you're watching this in America, yeah? People watch, uh, I don't know, like, NBA or whatever it may be. And if you look at, for example, one of the top guys playing in that industry... Messi, for example, no one can have any controversy about his greatness in that field. You, there's a sense of beauty that is related to that. Now, if I go and play football myself with my lumbering, uh, uncoordinated self, or somebody who is a complete novice, is never, and if you compare the two kinds of football playing, I mean, you could say that the way Messi plays football is not just functionally better, but it's actually more beautiful. Why? Because we already have an inbuilt sense of aesthetic taste. Look, if you get the, the extremities of the situation, the situation becomes more clear. For instance, if I say, if I were to put something very vile to be eaten, like, uh, I'm not going to mention anything, but think of the vilest thing that no one would eat, the most unedible thing in the world. Foul stench, foul stench, but it's still edible in the sense that I give you nutritional value and I give you a fantastic dish, let's say a curry or I don't know what it may be, like whatever your favorite dish is, uh, chicken or this or that, whatever. Most people in the world would say this is objectively better than this in taste. It's objectively, it's, I don't care what anyone says, objectively this is actually better to eat than this in terms of taste. So we all have that sense of, and if this wasn't the case, then why are not, uh, you know, supermarkets and uh, restaurants just put anything on there, on there? Because there's a sense of collective understanding of taste which we all respect. Now, this becomes more controversial when we start talking about human beings. Because we say, okay, well, look, that's all well and good, but you're going to apply the same thing to human beings. We would say we have to apply the same thing to human beings. Now, let me give you an example. I, with all due respect, I'm not saying that every human being, you know, 
الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك يا رب Allah he says لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم we have created the human being in the best of proportions so from one perspective human being is created in the best of proportions all human beings but from another perspective there's clearly a differentiation in uh, what we what we perceive but what could also be said to be beauty or lack thereof so for example uh, if you get somebody and and completely deform them if you deform them like you take away the eye and this and that and burn them or if you burn somebody you cannot tell me that objectively they look better than they used to beauty is in the eye of the beholder no it's not like that because if you take that to all cultures of the world they'll say this one looks objectively better if you get someone and pour acid in their face and say are there, is there an objective difference and most people will say yes the subjectivist camp will say no you're just imposing whatever because of this and that whatever there is a degree of subjectivity i'm not saying the degree of there's no degree of subjectivity but to argue that everything is subjective it would run counter to everything we know as human beings so there's a degree of interpretive i'm not saying that the interpretive sentimental uh, thing which is based on our upbringing based on psycho psychology or our parents or what we consider or homogamy for example there's a thing, you know we've all heard of hypergamy <laughs> Hyper, I mean, now, nowadays it's become a very famous thing that women for example marry across and up dominance hierarchies but we don't talk about homogamy which is the idea that women also marry just like men do for the most part people from their own from their own race from their own ethnicity that is actually the, the common trend a black woman is likely to find a black man attractive more so than a white man in fact now is that because of what well, it's just the way it is I mean that, that's what the the data says so maybe her idea of beauty is a little bit different because her upbringing is different. It's more similar to herself. It's more familiarity and stuff like that. A white woman is more likely to see a white man as attractive. On, by and large, of course, there's exceptions. Otherwise, you wouldn't have mixed race people. You wouldn't have people from different... Of course, there are exceptions. But I'm saying that homogamy is also a thing. But how, do you, how is homogamy explicable? It's only explicable for the fact that your own set of conditions and psychological background has contributed to you preferring one set of beauties as more or less important than another set of beauties. So there's a degree of subjectivity, but then once again, you cannot say you cannot render the whole thing subjective because if you do, you wouldn't be able to uh, explain many of the things. Having said this, now uh, there are also hedonistic conceptions. Uh, so, like for example, John Locke and others, but many of the hedonists would say a hedonistic conception of beauty is something like. Something is beauty if it causes you pleasure. Simple as that. If it causes you pleasure, then it's beautiful. If it doesn't cause you pleasure, it's not beautiful. Uh, you know, I mean, it, that, that, there's no evidence for that, effectively. There's, you can just say that that is an effect of beauty that causes you pleasure. But it's not, by and large, the only parameter. And in fact, David Hume, he, des he, he describes what's referred to as, um, I think, it's disinterested pleasure. Well, basically, uh, you've got to think about functionality because... For example, this pen, okay? I don't know. What is the function of a pen to write? Something which doesn't fulfill its function is not, in ma many people would say it's not beautiful because it doesn't do what it's meant to do. Many people would say like, if, uh, and we can go to Aquinas even, interestingly enough, he had this whole thing about the integrity of something, the dignity of something, and the clarity of something. He had three, a tripartite information of, uh, a, a distinction of what creates something which is beautiful that has to have integrity. And integrity means wholeness. Some, for something to be integrous, it has to be whole. And the function, uh, sorry, the clarity of something, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the clarity of something, I think the function of something as well. So the thing is, this is really, if you go back, it probably goes back to the Platonic forms. Like Plato, he believed that you had this world of forms, literally where everything has this, like, archetypal value in this world of forms. And what makes a pen a pen? What makes a, what makes a knife a knife? At what point does a knife become a sword? Think about that. I mean, like, if I say this is the best knife in the world and I bring you a sword, effectively, say this is not called a knife, this is called a sword. So at what point does it become a sword and at what point is it a knife? When the functionality may differ. At what point is it a pen? And at what point is it just a cylindrical object when the functionality is different? So in order for something to be beauty, beautiful, most people would say it has to fulfill a certain level of functionality. That's why Darwin was very, very upset about the peacock because he couldn't explain why it has all these feathers and all those kind of things. And then that's actually, it led him to the theory of sexual selection. 
because you know the peacock has all these colors and stuff like that and it's a way to try and attract the mate for the mating process so you have to try and create something called the theory of sexual selection but having said this i mean the point is is that function it, it features quite heavily hume said well actually something which is most beautiful is that which doesn't attempt to be functional in that regard it's called disinterested pleasure but he doesn't really offer reasons why that may be the case is heavily criticized so really and truly what counts as art what counts as uh, art, something art can be divided into two natural beauty and non-natural beauty right this is what it is but then really and truly the question is are actions are art and the reason why I bring this to your attention is there's a very interesting hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was walking with Aisha anha, yeah? and then a group of Jewish people came and they were started to attack the Prophet Assalamu Alaikum that is, may death be upon you and then Aisha responded and she started attacking the, the, that group of people and she said you know and upon you and this and that and she attacked them and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave her advice and this is a interesting <coughs> you know hadith which relates to the discussion on beauty he says, That rifq, or this idea of gentleness, it wasn't in something unless it made it beautiful. And it wasn't removed from something unless it, it made it ugly, effectively. So here, there's an indication from the prophetic hadith that actions can have beauty. And our claim as Muslim people is not just that the, the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad was the best behavior, or the most functional behavior, or the most guidance, but it's the most beautiful behavior as well. It's, we are making an argument from beauty. We are saying that it's the most beautiful behavior. Because if we, if we accept that virtuous actions, virtuous actions are counted as actions, then the pinnacle of that then is the most beautiful of behavior. It does tazin. It literally adorns the behavior. It's something good to look at. And that's why Wittgenstein, a very famous philosopher, he said that beauty is something you know it when you see it. Likewise, when you see good behavior or a virtuous behavior at the pinnacle, you know it when you see it. You don't need to have any training in philosophy or art or anything else. You know it when you see it. And that's why a lot of people convert it to Islam. And that's why it's, it's a missing part of our da'wah. When people just witness the Prophet Muhammad behaving in a certain manner, it was intuitive to them that this behavior is the pinnacle of virtuous action. And you don't need to have training in any field to know that. It's because it's the, it's the you call the golden mean, and we'll discuss what that means in a second, uh, in the section that follows, but it's the golden mean of all behaviors. It's the way he carried himself was exactly right. And to get that as a human being is extremely difficult. In fact, impossible, you could argue. Impossible for, 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 for another human being to... to, to we would argue, to replicate the fine balance that existed in the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad But before we get to the behavior, we need to talk about some of the physical descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad And we will actually read hadiths out, because I think when we talk about the seerah and stuff like that, I should say, there's a lot of discussion about the seerah, and obviously like we know that the seerah authors, that they were m much more lenient in terms of the gradation of hadith. But for our purposes, since we're making arguments, and we're making an intellectual case. I think it's only right for us to know the gradation of hadith. So I'm going to read it in translation, a lot of these hadiths. And then we'll discuss maybe a couple of things like that. But it's, it's good. It's a good habit for us to actually read the actual hadith itself, or at least a translation of it. And this is, uh, mashallah, it's a very good book. It's, I think, recently been translated of uh, Shema al muhammadiyya into English language. And uh, it's called A Portrait of the Prophet. You can buy it online. It's actually a very good translation. I commend the translator. It's a good work that's been done on it. So we'll do that. Obviously, this book has hadiths which are different gradations. Where people would consider that, okay, Tirmidhi. But Tirmidhi didn't like it, whether in his jama' or this book or any other book, he didn't attempt to put all the Sahih hadith in one place. Which means that you actually have to go through that, like, you have to have an awareness of what oh, this hadith is. There's some kalam on it, it's not kalam on it, or whatever. So we'll try and do that as much as possible uh, in, uh, in what follows. But just uh, I'll try and paint a picture quickly uh, of the of how the Prophet Sallallahu actually looked. How did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually look? So uh, there are some things which I, I think it's better for us to say that is Sahih to a high level, which means the authentication of Hadith is undisputable or undoubtable. Which is the following: that he wasn't that tall and he wasn't that short. 
some hadiths as we're going to cover say he was taller than the average man. He was taller than the average man, but he wasn't extremely tall. Now, what does that look like? I mean, how, what are you going to put? What's the height there? To be honest with you, in 1,400 years, I don't think the height of the Arab people is going to change that much. You could say a few inches here and there, possibly, as an average. And obviously, if you have a smaller population, the mean is going to be different because the extremities are eliminated. I mean, if, if now, if I asked uh, the Arab people in, let's say, the Khalij region, which are most genetically similar to the Prophet, undoubtedly, yeah, someone will want to con uh, dispute that, but it's not it's undisputable. It's most genetically similar that the average height may be five foot eight, five foot nine. Mm -hmm. That's probably what it is. I mean, that, that's maybe even being generous. Five foot nine, let's just say, for the sake of argument. If we want to add a couple of inches, we could say five foot ten, five foot eleven, because once again, the extremities are eliminated. But that's about what we're talking about. Now, he, he's at, taller than the average man. So add a couple of inches to that, for the sake of argument. We'll, we'll come to the hadith that says he's taller than the average man, because there's some discussion about that hadith. But for the sake of argument, if you add a couple of inches to that, he's anywhere between five foot ten and six foot two. I think that's fair. Five foot nine, six foot two. But I don't think he's anything but six foot two and over in any society in the world, even in South Sudan or in uh, Holland or whatever these countries that are seen as the tallest countries in the world, quote unquote, it would be seen as a tall man. Six foot two is seen as a tall man anywhere in the world at any time. Maybe if you go back two, three thousand, four thousand years ago, at that hit, like a uh, historical <coughs> period beyond the antiquity, maybe no, maybe the average was higher. Thamud times or whatever they want, maybe I mean, six five is the, is, the, is the average or six seven or six eight. We'll come to the reason why, why that's an interesting thing, but first of all, that's probably high, the height, anywhere between five foot nine to six foot one. I think this is the range. His he had a wide, he had wide shoulders. That that's hundred percent everywhere you'll find this, this this terminology is madbuah and this kind of big shoulders manakib the manakib or very wide is mentioned. So this actually in in the I don't know, physiological field is referred to as mesomorphic frame. Because there are three frames, which are the archetypal frames. I'm not sure if you guys have come across them. Well, you might have come across them. One of them is called the ectomorph, who is a very tall man, but very narrow. And then you have a mesomorph, who's kind of like not tall, not short, but, and he's quite wide. And the endomorph is a short man who gains fat very quickly. So short and fat. So by the, 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 as we'll come to, the definition of this He's not looking like a short man and he's not looking at, there's no protrusion from his stomach, as we'll see. The Prophet Sallam, his, his chest and his stomach were yeah, in level with each other. Therefore, he's closer to what is referred to as the mesomorph. Now, of course, there are combinations. So you can have a tall man who's wide, that's called an ectomiso, effectively, because he's got traits of both. You can have an endomiso, because that person is more likely to get fat. But, but it seems through the, if you like, descriptions here, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam had a mesomorphic frame. And I've come to the advantage of that because someone will say, why wasn't he a little bit a bit taller? Why wasn't he a bit more muscular? Like, you know, because we're living in an age when young men are going to ask, ask this question, especially, right? Because they see role models as bodybuilders and, uh, and athletes. So they say, oh, well, our prophet who was considered to be the top, top person, why, was, why wasn't he any more muscular than, than he was? Why wasn't he not like a bodybuilder, Ronnie Coleman or Jay Cutler? And we'll answer these questions uh, in, in, in a bit, but... It's interesting to ask, uh, to, to kind of put this first. So he didn't have a bulging belly. He had black eyes. And there was a contrast between his, the pupils and the white of the eye. So if you saw that, and if you've seen people that look like that, they stand out. And he had a thick, beautiful beard. Everyone, you know, recognized that. And his, do you know, the lashes of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu were long. The lashes. And there's no doubt about it. When, when someone has long lashes, that, that, is, that looks beautiful on any gender. It looks fantastic. My daughter has beautiful long lashes. I like looking at her. <laughs> you know, I, I love looking at just just looking at those lashes. That People now go and relax their lashes. It's a fantastic trait to have. That contrast, it creates uh, beauty. It create, when someone looks at it, it's, it's mesmerizing, in fact. And so you'll find a lot of the co companions saying, I looked at the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu I looked at the moon. And I, and I realized that he was more beautiful than the moon and the sun. But for me, that's more, of a, that's more of an indication of how much they thought the moon and the sun was beautiful than the Prophet himself. Because if you consider the fact, I mean, I think my, my children are more beautiful than the moon and sun, for, with all due respect. I mean, the, the point is, is that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they didn't have the words to describe what they were looking at. They did consider him to be a very, very good-looking man, handsome and beautiful. When you look at his face, 
the beard, the distinction, the masculinity was there, the kindness that was there, was gentleness was there. Some people even converted to Islam just looking at his face. They said, this is not, cannot be a face of a liar, and so on and so forth. But let's go back to the description. So his hair was long. For the most part, it was long. Obviously, he had different hairstyles because he went to Umrah and Hajj, and he'd cut his hair. But it, it went all the way down to his, kind of like his lobes. He had long hair. And that goes in line, like, you know, subhanAllah, when you see that kind of hair, it, it's, when it's not too curly, it's not too... Uh, it's not too straight and it's not too curly. There's, there's a bit of curls and it's not too straight. And then you've got the beard going on as well. It's that fantastic blend of what is referred to usually. People consider it nowadays to be feminine traits, like lashes and hair. But when you have a little bit of that, the contrast it creates is actually, it makes someone look on a different level. Let me put, let me put something to you, right? I know this sounds controversial, but I'm going to put it to you anyway. It, look at the men that most women find attractive. Look at them. Even in the West. It's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's actually more like the Leonardo DiCaprio's. Frankly. Why is that? Because they've got that, that contrast of what is seen as pretty, if you like, beautiful characteristics. And then the masculine characteristics as well. Obviously there's a colonial element there. We'll talk, to, talk about that. Why Leonardo DiCaprio not a black man? There, obviously there's a you know, hyper uh, push to try and create some beauty for the white man that's... But the, the white man can be beautiful. So can a black man, and so can any man from any race. The point is, is when you have that kind of, that mix going on, that contrast, it creates a new level of beauty that is well recognized cross-culturally, actually, in fact. It's, if, you, if you go in most cultures, if you see those kind of mixes together, it creates a kind of, uh, a beautiful contrasted image. And his eyes, it had iktahal on it, or it seemed like there was a natural slight blackening of the like if someone had put kuhl basically on the eye so it creates that distinction that contrast it creates that even more when you have that distinction that contrast you look at that and you think this person's looking at me now that's why a lot of these sahaba when they look at him they felt a bit shy actually they couldn't even look at him in the face because imagine someone with jet black eyes jet black eyes with a white perimeter long hair big beard and it's almost like, you know, the, 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 the blackening of the eyes underneath looking straight at you. Do you know what I mean? That is going gonna, is gonna to catch your attention. You're going to feel a bit shy. You're going to feel embarrassed. And that's how they felt about the situation. His nose, Salah Salam, I looked at this because I wanted to know what, what the, really the shape of his nose was. And the hadith that I came across is, uh, Ibn Hajj al said that it was basically Hassan, to be fair. Yani. His nose was basically it was effectively straight however there was a bit of an arch on his nose here and that the the point of the nose was small it was a small pointy like it was it wasn't uh bulging it was a small like effectively yeah so the, but the, there was a slight arch in his nose as well so this is a hadith which I've come across, which is actually Hassan as well. So now, what about his eyebrows? That's the question. What about his eyebrows? Now, this, I saw conflicting uh, discussion. Is his eyebrows like what you would refer to as a monobrow, or is it one? Is it this or that? So I saw two <coughs> different. The hadith of Umm Ma'bad, which is very, I mentioned it here, but we're discussing about it. There's some discussion about the weakness of the hadith. I mean, it's, uh, but it's mentioned in almost every Sira book, you know. But Albani says that, for example, it could be made strong if you look at some other turuq and so on and so forth. But it's a very, very long hadith. And I'll just give you the, the gist of it because it's, a, it's, it's too long to read now. And because it hasn't reached a level of authenticity that is sahih, frankly, uh, take it with a pinch of salt. But basically, it was a story of a particular woman. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was going by and he saw her. And then he, there was a particular sheep or a cow. Was it a cow or a sheep? Or well, a sheep. And he wanted to milk the, the sheep. And the woman said, this sheep is, is gone. This sheep is, is, is weak and it's emaciated. It's a weak sheep. You're not going to get any milk out of it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came and he got the, he got the ina, uh, the bottle, and he put the milk on the... And all the, it was like a miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all the milk came into the, to the thing and it fed so many people. And, it, and the, the hadith says, actually, he was the last to drink, which shows you a bit of his huluk as well. So he, get, he, drank, he got everyone to drink, and then he was the last one to drink. But then she went on to describe the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umm Ma'bad, 
And in that hadith, she just described that he was not too tall. And it's very interesting what she said in the hadith. La ya'isu min tall something like this. Like he, he doesn't suffer from being too tall. Which shows you an insight, even if the hadith is weak, that the Arabs of the day considered extreme height to be aib, actually. Considered it to be a deformity of some sorts. <laughs> That's true. You'll be surprised because nowadays, especially in like, I don't know, whatever, dating culture, whatever, people consider taller people to be, it's, it's the taller you are, the better you are, effectively. You can never be too tall. There's no such thing as too tall. Even if you're seven foot tall, you've you got street cred. You know, for some reason, I don't know what it is, but we'll come to that in a second. But the point is that the Arabs at the time considered being too tall to be some kind of, doesn't look right, doesn't look proportional, because they had this idea of proportionality probably more in line with what Aristotle was saying, which is that symmetry and proportionality and stuff. When you're tall, you, you know, you're lanky, your legs are long. Do you know what I mean? Your, your legs are usually longer than it. Most tall people, their legs are longer than the upper body. So there's that degree of improportionality. There's that gr degree of uh, unusuality. So she said, Laya is not tall. He is not too, he doesn't suffer from, effectively, doesn't suffer from being too tall. And in that hadith, she said that he has a parting between his eyebrows. So he doesn't have a monobrow. Like he, in fact, has a parting between his two eyebrows. And she mentions many different things. One of the things that she mentions, and is also mentioned in many of the hadiths which we'll read together, is that he had big hands and big feet. And that's a fantastic quality. It's so functional, and we'll come to the functionality of it, for any sport, and you, many people know that, it's having big hands and big strong hands and feet is actually one of the best things you can have. You can grip someone, you can grab someone, if you, especially if you're using a sword. Like if you're using uh, artillery and a shield and a sword and stuff like that. But it's also, the, the companions described it as his hands being like silk. Like it was soft, but it was big at the same time. I, I can't imagine a better combination. Now honestly, I mean, this. <laughs> Uh, I wish, I mean, it's, uh, I've got big hands only because I'm, you know, big. But imagine having, like, bigger hands for your body. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It does, if you've seen how that looks, it looks really good. And when someone clenches their fist in that situation, their fist looks big and chunky. Which means that if, it, if, you, if you want to inflict damage of any kind of sorts, then you're, it's actually good for that reason. So, that, these are some of the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His complexion was, they say he was light brown. Okay, now obviously the, the words used in the Azhar and Abiyad, and the, it's not actually the Caucasian. There's no chance he was Caucasian. Yani. Some people try and say, well, Abiyad, and then they consider a white man. There's no way the Prophet ﷺ, being an Arab, had that complexion. The, the Arabs, in fact, called that as Banu al-Asfar. The people of uh, the, the Romans, they called them the, the yellow, effectively, yellow man. Because the Caucasian skin tone is different to the the, 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 the Azhar or the Abiyad or the lighter skin tones in the Arabs. So he said that, I mean, a lot of the, and we'll come to it, but a lot of the, com uh, the co commentaries say that he had a reddish tinge. Now, if he had a reddish tinge, for example, if you look at my color, this is darker than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because I don't get, there's no reddish t t tinge that I have. I have more is African, uh, slightly African qualities so consider like i don't know like, uh, maybe i'll put the camera at somebody but but there's people in this room that have maybe yourself i, I would say it's like your kind of skin color <laughs> not to <laughs> not to put you on the spot but it's kind of like where you can see the redness a little bit as well but then if you get a tan you'll be dark as me so you have the propensity to be as dark as me if you put yourself under the sun but that's not your natural skin color that makes sense if, because your natural skin color you have a little bit of redness for that redness to appear you can't be like going on to almost the black man's skin color, almost there. Mm. It, it, it's not there, but it's not also the white man. Yeah. So you can see, subhanAllah, there's, 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 there's proportionality there, or at least there's uh, middle ground there as well, because the Prophet was sent for all people. Yeah. So for the white man and the black man, so he's somewhere in the so, middle. Yes. I'm also Pardon. five foot nine. Uh, oh, okay, so inshallah, <laughs> subhanAllah. <laughs> But your, your shoulders are not that wide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and your hands are quite small as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> so anyway. It's unnecessary. I'm only kidding. No, but yeah. So let's, let's I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to open this book up and actually read the hadith. All right. Unless someone wants to. Does someone want to volunteer to read? I don't mind. Does someone want to volunteer to read? Do you want to? No. Do you want to volunteer to read, bro? Uh, um, it's difficult. Oh, okay, that's no problem. I'll, I'll read it for you. I'm going to read just some hadiths, just because it's, I think we should need to get into the habit, even if it's an English language or some translation of hadith. These are on Bukhari and they're all strong. So I'm going to read the things that there's no doubt about because 
then we can uh, have no doubt about it. Allah's Messenger وسلم, was neither very tall of stature nor short. His skin was neither pale white nor tawny. And his hair was uh, neither crispy curled nor lank. Allah exalted as he sent him to serve as his messenger at the end of 40 years of his life. So he stayed in Mecca for 10 years and Medina for 10 years. And Allah took him unto himself at the end of 60 years with fewer uh, than 20 white hairs on his head and his beard. So he had white hairs, obviously that's a lot of the companions, in fact, Shemad al they would actually count the amount of white hairs he had on in his beard and his, uh, and his hair. So, yeah. How big is the writing? I can read it, let me see. Yeah, you can read the second hadith. Let me see. Yeah. That should be fine. Yeah, just read the second hadith. Yeah, that's fine. Control. He says 10 years in Mecca and 10 years in Medina. Where are they said? from? Yeah, they, 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 13 in Mecca. Yeah, yeah sure, maybe they were just like, you know, uh, what Three do you call it? Approximating. Yeah, approximating. You know, a lot of them yeah. say this kind of thing. But exactly, it's 13 in Mecca and yeah, yeah, Medina. that's what it is, yeah. 23 after the mm -hmm. um, Which one am I reading? The, just where it says two. Can two. you see? We, it? Oh, we have been told by Humayd ibn Mas'ada al Basri. Yeah. We have been told by Abdul, Abdul Abd al Wah. Yeah. Wahab al Thaqafi yeah. on the authority of who made that Anas ibn Malik said Allah's yeah. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, was of medium height, neither tall nor short. He was handsome physique and his hair was neither crisply curled nor smooth, brown of brown of colour. When he walked he used to stride confidently. Yes, I like that hadith. was it Yataki or was I don't know the, the Arabic, I need to look at it, but uh, Yes. So this, I was really, one of the really interesting things about the Prophet is to look at how he used to walk. Because the way he used to walk, fast. he used to be fast paced mm -hmm. and he used to be confident. This, by the way, someone's walk says a lot about them. Honestly, the way, obviously the Quran says, Like, you don't walk in the, don't walk in the earth. Arrogantly, because you're not going to crack the earth and you're not going to reach the mountains in height. Meaning, humble yourself, right? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to walk in a manner that was confident that even the, uh, the Sahaba used to say that he, he looks like he was coming down from a mountain or from a hill or something like that. So there was a, there was a moving, fast-paced. But at the same time, it wasn't arrogant. No one has ever said that he looked arrogant or kibber or mutajib bin nafsi or any of these things, grandiosity. To get that the walk right, you know, of how a human being walks, it says a lot about, about their temperament. He's not walking with his chest out. You know, he's not, he's not walking with his chest out. He's not walking like, you know, with a bop. He's not doing any of that. No, honestly. But he's at the same time, yeah, he's not doing it. You know, but at the same time, he's not walking meekly, weakly, pretending to be overly humble, but actually it's a weak walk. And you, and, uh, and you see that as well. I mean, you see the two extremes. You see people walking like this, and you, to get the walk right. Now, pe nowadays people analyze how people walk. So there's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of videos I watched online on Putin. I don't know why, but he's got a very specific walk. Yeah. People are looking at. It, he puts one hand in his pocket and he swings the other hand. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? It's, people say, why does he do that and whatever? But he's trying to get that balance. But it looks a bit odd. Mm -hmm. He's a he's a statesman. He's probably been advised by lots of people. He wants to appear strong but not arrogant. But he ends up looking a bit like a freak because he's swinging his hand like a pen pendulum. It's, it's a, bit, a bit awkward, a bit awkward. But to get the walk right as a man, the Prophet ﷺ, his walk was so noticeable that the Sahaba would mention about his walk. Another thing which we're going to cover inshallah in the hadith is when the Prophet went to a different environment, he'd look around. He'd, he's very aware of his environment. So he'd look around, he'd look this and that. Do you know what I mean? Because being in a place and you don't know what you're doing and you put your head down and you've got a, It's actually, first of all, dangerous. Because you don't know what... Nowadays, we're living in an unpredictable environment, military, this and that, knife crime, whatever it is. Doing that is actually dangerous, especially going out with your family. The Prophet of someone used to go somewhere with his friends or whatever. He used to look around, see, okay, what is the... Where are the hazards here? Where am I? How am I situated? These are all very important things for a man or a woman to do in following the Prophet Sallallahu footsteps. You want to read the next hadith? I mean. uh, also, you know, when it comes to walking, yeah. can we not give it like um, putting it in that, like, putting it in its right place? Because there were, there were. There, remember that Sheikh? Maybe you can help us. You know, there was a companion who was walking arrogantly in war, and one of the companions said, "Allah hates this walk," but he said, "Not in this context, yeah. because we're facing the enemy." So, can we not say like in specific context where 
Argument sake, for example, enemies of Islam. when we're confronting, let's say, the enemies of Islam, argument sake, yeah, like me and Hijab went to a freedom of speech event, you know, and then Hijab had to put his gum shield and you know, <laughs> uh, you know, had to start walking, you know, until he got punched in the face, you know, and then and then and then I, I ran away. <laughs> we'll so, talk about courage and something else. <laughs> no, 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 that was in that was we'll tactical follow. retreat. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, Chef, wouldn't you say, for example, in certain uh, circumstances, that to do that is not arrogance? And I think the Prophet would have, I'm sure, how he walked in war. Do you think it will be like, you know, to that condition, that situation that you're in? Yeah, it depends on the context. Yeah. In certain context, for example, a person needs to show his strength. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after Salah Hudaybiyah, the next year, they came back to Mecca, what they call Umrah Al-Qadiyah, or Umrah Al-Qadha. Mm. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised the companions to show strength mm. when they wear the ihram, oh, you know, shoulder, yeah, yeah, and they would, yani. Uh, make uh, all of the tawaf a bit hasty mm. uh, just because uh, because there was a, a, a widespread uh, between Quraysh that uh, the people of Medina come to you uh, weakened by the fever of Medina so the Prophet ﷺ want to show something wow. so that emphasized the point mm. and as you mentioned uh, there one of companions Abu Dujana uh, was on actually on his horse and was Yeah, and he, uh, making the whole yeah, making the whole, uh, yeah, in an arrogant way. Mm. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the hadith that Allah Azza dislikes this way of walking, except in this situation of exactly. this scenery. Yeah. And is it also, Sheikh, you know, was that Muawiyah when he was conquering Egypt? I can't remember where he was when they were asking him. I think he was indulging, not indulged, but like you know, some materialism. Yeah, so Umar. Yeah. Was it? Was it? Yeah, so Umar bin Khattab when he uh, met Muawiyah yeah. in Sham. Yes. He was uh, he frowned a bit. He was displeased with the fact that Muawiyah had let's say big castles in material. So uh, yeah, he asked him, "What are you doing?" So he told him, "Because we are on the borders of Islam, we have to show strength." Yeah. So Umar al Khattab uh, told him, "You know best about the situation." Wow. So that also shows something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get one more hadith? Yeah, uh, sure. So um, we have been told by Muhammad ibn Bash Bashar Bashar. No, Bashar Al Abdi. We have been told by Muhammad ibn Jafar, Jafar, according to Shua, Shua, Shuba ibn Ishaq, said, I heard, sorry, Sheikh, I, I destroyed the names here. Uh, please forgive me. Uh, I heard Al, Al Bara ibn Azib say, Allah's Messenger sallallahu wasallam, said, uh, Oh, no, um, was neither curly nor lank head of medium height, broad shouldered. With luxuriant hair, reaching the lobes of his ears, wearing a red suit of clothes, I have never seen anything more mute, more beautiful than him. And a lot of the Sahaba said that when, the, when there was a day where the Prophet, or more than one occasion, when he was wearing this kind of red, kind of cloak that he put on himself, when he came out, looking uh, as he does with that cloak on, they said many of them were just like you know, he, they were, I've never seen anything better than that. Julius Caesar used to wear. A red cloak in battle as well. Really? Yeah, he put it on deliberately. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, the Caesar would put it on to say, Caesar. "Look, I'm the man. Come really? and get me." Yeah, really? that would yeah. made his uh, mm. increased his respect. Yeah. Doesn't his. that doesn't that like contradict what the prophet actually was like? He was very humble and he no, no, sure. I mean, the 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 red wasn't meant to indicate mm. like Caesar, mm -hmm. like you know, come yeah. and get me. Mm. There was other things the prophet Sallam did. That would indicate that he was courageous, which we're going to come to, on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But the red is just, he, for example, there are many narrations about what the Prophet ﷺ used to wear. So the, the the red cloak was one of the things that have been transmitted by a lot of people. But also there was a particular thing, particular piece of clothing, Yemeni clothing, which was striped clothes. It was striped. And I suppose I mentioned Shema al Muhammadiyah as well. Which is also like, you know, so it shows you he had different styles so if one time you were in the red sometimes you were in the striped and that's why it's actually important for a man or a woman to look at look care, be careful of what they wear you know take care of what they wear so because they narrated the companions narrated what it looks like. and look at the, the hair how it's being described luxuriant hair so it has that voluminosity it has that depth and you can see like you got, the beard has depth and the hair had depth and it was curly it wasn't too straight and it wasn't too curly as well it was for his texture and complexion and whatever he was it was the right it was the right mix
Can I say something? Else? Um, it seems like which, which it, from the way we're describing the prophet here, it seems like he had a luxurious life and that he used gel to make it so nice and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Can we like maybe um, explain that this was just his natural state? I think you've just done that. I think that's true. Yeah, right? yeah, because <laughs> it sounds like it, absolutely. Yeah. He would comb his, yeah. his beard and his hair and stuff like that, but he wouldn't spend too much time as, as uh, in vanity uh, looking at you know. Gelling his hair or whatever, they didn't have gel at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, can I get the book back, uh, Ali? Is it possible? Just... Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Another thing I, can, I was yeah. going to say, do you, yeah. not, do you not think that it's important that, like, for example, people who are in the dawah, mm -hmm. like it's very important the way we dress, the way we conduct ourselves, be it, you know, how we look. Sheikh, would you say that it is important for us to conduct ourselves in a way where, like, for example, be it physical appearance, you know? You know, myself, I didn't choose to be handsome, Sheikh. I know. <laughs> I'm joking, Sheikh. But in a nutshell, Sheikh, wouldn't you say, looking at this, what we're going through, isn't it important for a person in the dawah to have a certain demeanor, look, look a certain way? Because it seems like the Prophet, the way he walked, like when he would speak to somebody, he would turn his you know, direction to him. So do you think that is something that we can use? Because today I actually got someone sent me, um, that I don't know if it was Sheikh Bin Baz, like he was saying that a person who's in the dawah, who adorns himself, like he should be warned against um i don't know where you got this kalam from but how do we find the middle path where we're just like you know it's not all about the outer but for the sake let's say for the sake of allah the way we conduct ourselves like for example with our organization salam we started to wear suits because we realized we try t-shirts we try jumpers and people don't take you seriously but the moment you wear a suit all of a sudden it's like oh what are you selling we and it's yeah like what would you say just so we uh, yeah, mainly, for example, uh, there's a hadith in relation that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Allah Azza wa made the prophets in the most beautified way. So that shows something. And usually people will uh, accept knowledge from a person with a certain demeanor that he wouldn't accept it from. So it shows wisdom from, uh, from the side of Allah Azza wa that he created all prophets and he created the Prophet ﷺ in this, uh, with these features. Hmm. So, uh, and we know the hadith of Prophet ﷺ, Allah jameel yuhibbu al-jamaa, that Allah Azza wa is beautiful and he likes beauty. Uh, yani in response to the companion that said that a person likes uh, uh, his clothing to be beautiful and he likes uh, his uh, shoe wear to be beautiful. Hmm. So, yeah. Yani, and do you know, it's yeah. interesting you mentioned that hadith because if you took that hadith and applied it to the context, the discussion that we were just having before about the aesthetics, then we, we believe that Allah, like for example, when we talk about the moral issue, we said that really what goodness is, Allah is good, and so wherever goodness is, that's where, uh, that's where goodness is, right? And then when you remove goodness, that's where evil is. Likewise, you could say that Allah is jameel, right? So how is it explicable that we have things which are at least on face value, value cross-culturally, you know, uh, considered to be beautiful. It could be said that this is an extension or manifestation of the Jamal of Allah, the beauty of Allah. Because it, the thing is, a lot of the reason why you find these discussions between philosophers as to about morality and mathematics and beauty, all these three categories in particular, because they're kind of, they have a different ontological status to science, is because you can't put them under a microscope. But then how do you explain that all these people conceive of them in the same way? So with a robust theological understanding, like for example, we're saying that Allah is Jamil, therefore, where there's manifestation of Jamal or beauty, that is where the beauty is. And when that's removed, that's where the beauty is not. Same thing can be said about morality. So having the attributes of God uh, actually being as an explaining force for how these things are explicable, actually is one of the most powerful things we have. Uh, in, the, in the Islamic tradition because I'm cognizant of time I just want to move on to the next do you want to it's just a quick question so what age range are we talking about for the Prophet peace be upon him and what, what was he like when he was like younger 20s? So a lot of these descriptions would be consistent throughout the time that they were because from 40 to 63 this is what we're talking obviously right that's when they were jotting down what he looked like but when he got a bit older the, the main difference would be that he had some obviously whitening and graying of his beard and, but as we mentioned it's not even that much so well, there was a level of that, uh, but it wasn't uh, yeah. that much. And the fact that, that that stuff is mentioned, like for example, there are aspects about the Prophet uh, physical appearance, which I mentioned, which show you that it's it's not some kind of a mythological figure that's being described here. Yeah. The white, the whiteness of the beard, the slight arch of the nose. There's lots of things there. 
that you can see that it's not a mythological figure being described. It's a human being, okay, which no one would have, if you want to portray him in a manner that would seem extra human, you wouldn't put the, inject those aspects in there. Even during battles, when he loses his teeth and stuff like that. For example, yeah, in Uhud, where he lost his teeth and stuff like that, if he was meant to be this kind of extra human person that never was touched and never was hurt and never, his hair never became grey and nothing happened to him, once again, that would, uh, we would look at it with suspicion, say what kind of, uh, what's going on here. But the fact that these aspects are there as well, goes back to the first session that we talked about, about preservation. So I want to ask questions now. Why not taller? Why not shorter? Why not bodybuilder? Not why, let me ask this question. I mean, let, let, so why was Prophet not taller? Ask what does actually height benefit in? Okay, so really and truly, if you look at, for the sake of argument, the sports that human beings play, the sports that human beings play, where height is actually an advantage, there's only really a few sports, if you consider it. Like basketball is an obvious one, right? Being a goalkeeper, maybe in a, in a football match. Being a footballer, height is not actually advantageous. Otherwise, the tallest footballers, the best footballers will be the tallest ones. In fact, probably the opposite is true. Yeah. Some of the best footballers are the shortest ones. Like a Messi is probably about five foot six or something. I don't know Maradona. Yeah. Maradona and so on. It's not really that. So where there's a, a kickboxing, there is, there is a, actually, there, there's a correlation. A lot of the kickboxers were tall and they had long legs. But even then, like with boxing and stuff, if you look at the Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson 5'10", 5'11", if you look at the majority of UFC champions, for the sake of argument, MMA champions, they're not actually six foot five and over. They're not. And that's the heavyweight division. Wrestlers. Wrestlers are not the tallest people Swimming. in the world. Swimming are not the tallest people in the world. Although Phelps had a very high... Yeah. If you look at Phelps, for example, who's the best uh, swimmer of all time, he, he was tall. He was about six foot three. But he had a very unusual... He had like a Johnny Bravo type body. So his, short, his lower half, he had short legs and high torso. Mm -hmm. That's why he can, you know, do the thing. So he had a very... But Allah didn't send the Prophet Asa for the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, the, it's the case. So why does he need... Like I said, if, if, you, if, we were being, if we're playing the law of averages here, on a sports level, what is the most... If you could ask the question, what is the most advantageous body type? I would say it's the mesomorphic. It's the mesomorphic body type. Unless we're talking about very specific sports where height is required. Or, where, or the opposite, where shortness is required. There are some sports where being short can be advantageous. I don't know of them now, at the top of my head. Jockey. Oh, jockey, yeah. Jockey? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that right, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. F1, F1 driver. Yeah, but maybe, fo maybe football, bro. Maybe, maybe like what considers to be like below 5'7 or 5'0, whatever, where you've got a lower center of gravity, it might be good. Even some kinds of wrestling. Look at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example, one of the best of all time, Marcio Garcella, uh, Garcella or if I'm saying his name wrong, but he's like 5'6 or 5'7. Bro, Sanchai, we're talking about kickboxing. Sanchai, who's seen as the best kickboxer of all time, is 5'6. He's 5'6, that's how tall he is, but he, he takes out the tallest and the most lanky of opposition. Sanchai. So, being tall, this, there is this misnomer that somehow being tall makes you. It's, over, it's actually overrated in the current, in the current age. So people say, why isn't he taller? Why should he be taller? What function? He, what is the Prophet doing? The Prophet is engaging in war. Okay, okay, fine. If he's engaging in war with swords, then are the ones who are fencing, are the, are the best fences the tallest ones? Not necessarily. Surely there can be some kind of an advantage of having a longer reach. There's, I'm not saying so. There isn't. Of having a longer reach when it comes to fencing and sword fighting. There would be some advantage. But we haven't got the information here, but reach is different to height, by the way. For, for example, if you look at... Uh, Konofsky. Huh? Volkanovsky. Volkanovsky is, I don't know what his reach is, probably 74 or something like that, but he's quite short. Volkanovsky. Alexander the Great was tiny, he was 5 foot 5 or something. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He's really small. But, like, for example, um, a lot of these... A lot of these uh, McGregor is like 5 foot 8, but he's got like a 76 reach. So, reach is different to... And then there's the difference between the arm reach and the leg reach. So anyway, these are all things. But what I'm saying to you is that being tall is overrated in the current society. So why, why then want to impose something which doesn't have really any functional value and say, why was he not taller? Because a lot of people will be asking, why is he not taller? Why should he be taller? It's not like being taller is going to give you that much advantage. The second thing could be said is, which is, why was he not more muscular? Well, if anyone knows anyone think, anything about sports, they know that being muscular is actually cumbersome and unfunctional. Mm. Now look, for example, just at boxing for the sake of argument. Anthony Joshua was quite a, he would be considered a muscular boxer. 
But then he had to lose all this weight because actually it wasn't helping him. If you look at the beginning of his uh, kind of title defenses and stuff, he was about 110 kilos, 112, 113 kilos. He went down to 106 because it wasn't helping him. It was, it was gassing him out. Now imagine now you're running up. You're, ru you're, you're in, in, in the military environment. You're running. You're moving. Being heavy does not help you. It doesn't. Being a big man doesn't help you. A huge man. Obviously being somewhat big is fine, but being a huge man with a lot of weight doesn't help. I went to Jabal, uh, what do you call it? Noor. Uh, Jabal Noor, right? Where the Gharth uh, Hara is there. Everybody else found it easier to get up that hill than me. Every single other person found it easier. I found it hardest to get up the hill. At the time I was 125 kilos. I'm telling you, it's, it, the reason why is because of the gravity and the weight and stuff. So imagine now, even for something as simple as the process I'm going to the Gharth, it would have been difficult for him to do it. it would have, I was actually finding it was a, it was a strenuous workout. It was a strenuous workout. So being that heavy and muscular and stuff, how is that helping anybody? So I think people now overrate the muscular frame. There's no reason for... But surely, they all said he was athletic frame. They all said he was athletic frame. So if you if he had that athletic frame, he, had the, he has everything that is required for his mission. Here's the long story. Uh, so these are just some things. I know some young people are thinking about this. In the back and of there. You, you can also say like Andy Ruiz, a fat Andy Ruiz, yeah. beat Anthony Joshua. Yeah. Like, that that like, says a lot, you know. Yeah, his cardio was probably insane as well, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But still, he, he was fat. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So body shape is not always, it's not, doesn't translate into functionality. I'm, everyone knows that. I, it's becoming a joke when they put this kind of, if you go online, like bodybuilder, bodybuilder versus. See a bodybuilder versus a BJJ guy. That's, mm -hmm. Like, for example, a Carl Froch. I mean, oh, I don't know. Golovkin. I don't know. Get me a, a guy that's 65 kilo, 70 kilo, but at the highest level of boxing. Okay. 70 kilo. And give me Ronnie Coleman. Who would win in a fight? <laughs> Is that even a question? It's no question. He would be completely demolished. The boxer would win. Or let's say, for example, a BJJ practitioner. A small guy, Gordon Orion or something like that. Mm -hmm. Get, put him next to, I don't know, like your biggest body, Jay Cutler. Who's going to win in a fight? There's not even a question. No one's going to ask that question seriously because they know that muscle doesn't translate into functionality. Mm -hmm. So being a huge profit and stuff, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. In fact, it's, that is really bodybuilding is more, and even Arnold Schwarzenegger said this himself. He said bodybuilding is more of an art than a sport. Mm -hmm. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying, it looks nice if you, within certain contexts, it looks nice. And you can, there is some level of functionality to it. You, you are stronger by having that much muscle. But the, the disadvantages on mass like on balance, I should say, there's actually more than the advantages. A lot of them die because uh, steroid uses. If you want to get to the highest level, you have to take steroids. Th this body that you're seeing now is a steroid body. Like, you know what I mean? If you look at the natural in the, in the early two, you know, 20th century, 21st century, 20th century, George, what's his name? Sir? Atlas or these kinds of bodies. Atlas. Charles Atlas. <laughs> that body is completely different to bloody what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So what steroids does, it changes the game completely. And so uh, you couldn't get to that level. We are now seeing freaks of human beings. That could never exist in any other time in human history. Mm -hmm. The most muscular men of today are the most muscular men of all time. The most muscular, like the, there's no human epoch where it had Ronnie Coleman in it. <laughs> there's not, except for the, the one that we had. The Greeks used to... Uh, they were big and strong, but yeah. nothing like Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. They didn't have those steroids, they didn't have yeah. what we had. I mean, if you just look at the 60s and 70s compared to the 2000s in terms of the Mr. Olympia, there is a massive difference. Mm. And that doesn't look good. And these guys get, look at Ronnie Coleman. How many uh, operations did he have, surgeries? And he's on a wheelchair. He's on a wheelchair, the man. Yeah. So it's not something which it shows you. I mean, what's the advantage of that? It's no longevity. No longevity. It doesn't, it doesn't, frankly, it doesn't even look good, no, uh, in my opinion. And, and the, but I can see within the parameters of bodybuilding why it would look good. Like if I had got myself into the cultures, okay, or whatever, I can see, okay, this is good and this is whatever. But... For, for me, it's not, it's not functional, it's, it doesn't do anything. Now, moving on, so uh, let's go to another question now, which is, what is virtue? Okay, and I've just skipped, um, we're going to go back to the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all that kind of stuff, but we're gonna, we talked about the, the physical characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now we have an image of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? We know what he looks like, we know what he, we, we've got what his facial structure looks like, what his eyes look like, what his eyebrows look like, what his nose look like, what his beard look like, what his hair look like. That's the full thing, you know, what his body looked like, it's all there. So the question now is, the question is, what did he act like? Because now we're going to try and get the full picture. But before we get to what did he act like, 
we have to ask, just like we did with the question of beauty, we have to ask a um, kind of preceding question, which is, what is virtue anyway? What is virtue? This is a very important question. I mean, the, the, really and truly, the first person to, I mean, not the first person, the first people to really talk about this and write about this, I mean, that we have in the Western tradition, and I'll be very specific here, not obviously in any tradition, are the Greeks. And in particular, I think one of the, the f main books on this topic is a book called the Nicomachean Ethics. The Nicomachean Ethics was a book that Aristotle wrote to his son. Okay, his son is, I think, Nicomachus or whatever his name was, right? And he, and he wrote a book for him talking about what is, um, what's good, what, is, what does it look like to be virtuous. And in this book, basically what he was saying was that he was saying, he had this idea of the golden mean, that you've got two, two sides of the extremities and then you have them in the middle. But what is it, all this moving towards? Something he called eudaimonia. So it's what he's referred to as the good life, well-being, welfare, satisfaction, fulfillment. His idea was that if you act in these ways, you're going to be fulfilled in life. If you act in these virtuous manner. And he was half right, and we'll come to that. He was half right about that. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ said, I have only been sent so I can perfect good character. I have only, innama. I have only been sent to perfect good character. But there was a missing ingredient in Aristotle's concoction, which we'll come to in a second. And some of the things that he proposed were problematic. Before we get to that, though, he had 18 virtues, 18, which he said are the most important virtues. Okay, And of these 18, he said nine of them, nine of the 18, are the chief most important kind of uh, virtues. So I'm going to go through them with you. And then I'm going to explain how he came to the, those conclusions. So the first one, and by the way, the most important one according to him was courage. Because he said that if you don't have courage, you can't do anything else. Yeah, and for him, the, the, the main virtue was if you don't have courage, you cannot, do, you cannot implement anything in your life. If you're a coward, it's the worst thing you can effectively be. And in fact, there's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Sharrun mafar rajuli, bukhlun hala, wa jubnun khala. The worst thing that's in a man is stinginess and cowardice. So in a way, there is some level of Islamic corroboration of this, but courage was seen by Aristotle to be the most important thing. In addition to courage, Temperance. Now, what is temperance? Temperance is the idea of self-control among the, the uh, desires. And there were two desires in particular that he re referred to and many others after him referred to, referred to as the irascible and uh, referred to as the, um, the irascible desires, which is basically your anger. And being angry is being your irascible if you're ang angry. And uh, what's the other one? Um, uh, and your sexual desires. Yeah. Which he, there's, a, there's a technical term for it, which I, f I forget now. Uh, um, no. It'll come to me. It'll come to you. Chastity. Come. No, no, no. Just, no. He, this, uh, it's called the. It's another term for it. But I'll come to it, yeah? It's going to come in the next slide, in fact. But temperance is where you're able to control those two desires. Let me show you the next slide. Libido. Like no, no, no. It's. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, no, it's not in the next slide. It's okay, we'll, we'll come to it, don't worry. But basically, your two sexual desires, if you, and all other desires, like anger, sexual desires, temperance is your ability to control those two. And we'll come to how the Prophet ﷺ did that. In fact, we can mention it now, because it's, it's, it's quite easy to mention. I'll mention three examples. Okay. One example is that the, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet ﷺ is in Bukhari. So I should mention this hadith is in Bukhari. And she said that the Prophet ﷺ used to kiss his wives in Ramadan. Now, obviously, why she's mentioning that is because there's different rulings for different people with that regard. Like a platonic kiss, not a romantic or, or a sexual kiss. It's, a, it's just a platonic kiss. She said that he used to kiss his wives in Ramadan and that he's amlakakum li erbihi. He is the most in control of his sexual desires. In other words, it wouldn't phase him. He wouldn't feel like he needs to do anything. He was amlakakum li And this is interesting that Aisha is the one who said this because of what kind of attacks that we have of the Prophet vis-a-vis vis -vis Aisha. As if he was, you know, trying, he, he was lusting over her and all these kind of things that they're trying to say. But if that's the case, why is she the one that's testifying that he's amlakakum li the, And she's speaking with confidence. He's the best of you. And she's referring to all of the men to his sexual desires. She knows that there's no higher that he can be than that. And on that point, by the way, the, this might sound a bit uh, unusual. I came across a hadith, and I need to check the of it, 
But the Prophet, Aisha said that she's never seen the Prophet's private parts. Now, now you might find that yani, unusual, but I don't know how that came about, but yani, she says this. So it shows you the sensibility and the, the privacy and the, the potentially shows the shyness that she had towards him. She says a hadith. I'll, I'll bring the hadith. I'll bring the hadith. But there's that, there's that aspect. But that's the first thing I want to bring is Amlekum Lirbi. This is in Bukhari, this well known hadith. The second hadith is the following. This is also in Bukhari, where there was a woman that Prophet married. Not people know her name. Her name is Bintu Joan. Al Jawniya, or they, they give her different names. And she basically said in the, in the night of consummation, she said, Audubillamink. She said to the Prophet, I seek refuge in Allah from you. Now, the scholars of hadith, they discuss why did she even say this word? Ibn Hajar says, for example, Last Kalani, he says that Aisha radiallahu anha said to her, This is something the Prophet would enjoy for you to say. It's a weird thing to say. But she said that to try and make, to try and create this discord and create a divorce. <laughs> Maybe. And she and this was is, divorced, yeah? Huh? She was divorced. So what happened is that Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, Ithabi lihlik, or go back to your family, which means it was divorced. Now, this is a very important hadith for many reasons. There are many anti-Islamic apologists, effectively, who are liars, who lie about the Prophet ﷺ, say that he forced women in a manner that is indecent. Yeah? But this hadith itself is a great refutation of that. Because if that was his proclivity and his temperament, then why is he telling another woman in the heat of the moment to go back to your family? When she indicated in, the, in not even a clear, fully clear manner that she didn't want to be in that situation. He didn't say, no, you're, I am your husband and it must be and you must give me my rights. He said, if you don't want to be here, then you leave. And she left and it was a divorce. And so there wasn't a consummation of that marriage. So the so-called, the, they call it grape or allegations, whatever. This, this itself shows you how feeble those attempts are. And by the way, there's no one hadith itlaqan that indicates at all that the Prophet ﷺ ever forced a woman to do something she didn't want to do in that regard. So it shows you not only that these accusations are false, but it also shows you that when the Prophet ﷺ, by the admission of the women around him and the testimonials around him, he was never taking advantage in that manner. And that he was in control of himself and he was temperate in that, in that way. Another thing is to see his behavior before he married Khadija. By all accounts, as we'll find, by all accounts, as we'll find, he was no, not known in the community for go, going with women. But if his behavior and his temper, if his general disposition was that of a man who was lustful and so on, so how don't we have any report, not even one, saying that he was engaging with a woman before Khadija? And when he was with Khadija, that he was only with Khadija. For a man of that age, until 25 years old, in that society, it would be seen as unusual for him to be chased for that long, for that long effectively. And then when he's 25 to 40, for him to continue just with one woman and there's no indication that he even married a second. But that shows you a degree of discipline, and a degree of temperance, and a degree of controlling your desires. Especially in a situation, we think we have it bad. They had it bad as well. They had prostitutes, they had women, they had people who were naked, they had slave girls in the market, they had everything. We think we're the only men in history that have seen women on billboards and naked people. They also saw naked people walking around. The Prophet was shielded from that and will not engage in that culture. And there's no one report that indicates anything to the, to the contrary of what I've just mentioned. So these are just three examples of the temperance of the Prophet Courage, I'm going to... I'm going to treat separately. That's why I've, I've left it for now because I want to define what that is. I want to talk about it. And it's, it's, a, it's one of those virtues that I think it needs, we need to talk about in a bit more detail. Liberality, and this is something which is kind of in the Quran. So it's between what is uh, being stingy and profligate, which is, which is the idea of b being extravagant or pay, spending money out of no reason and without wisdom. And Allah says in the Quran, Do not bring your hand, you know, to your neck effectively. And this is like, obviously, a metaphor, metaphoric uh, description. And do not extend it all the way. Which means, don't overspend and don't keep it too close. But if you look, and we'll talk about it, the Prophet was generous. And he was the most generous. And I'll show you some of the hadith that relate to the generosity of the Prophet. You'll be very surprised. You'll be extremely surprised, which, by the way, dispels and dismisses the hadith that I'm going to present. Dispels and dismisses the idea that Prophet was doing this for money, was for doing this for material gain. And we'll come to those hadith 
in due course. But obviously, we did, if we did this with every single one of them, it would be problematic. Magnificence is basically ahsan, uh, proficiency in doing a good job of something. So this is one of the things that Aristotle talks about as well. And, and you can see the connection there between the Islamic paradigm. And there's many uh, hadith of 40 Nawi. You know, uh, you know, if you're going to do something, then... It, yeah, no, Ihsan. But it's, I mean, it's the idea, like, you know, uh, like, you know, if you're going to slaughter, then do it with Ihsan. Because there's, in fact, this is a very interesting hadith, you know, uh, because it shows you that there are some things that you have to do more proficiently than others. For example, if you're going to slaughter an animal and you do that unproficiently, without prudence and competence, you're making the animal suffer. Mm -hmm. But likewise, if you if you are a surgeon and you have to commit, you have to perform surgery and you don't do that with ihsan, you can cause death. As the Prophet said, "Man tatabba wa lam yakum bi ma'rufan fa asaba nafsan fa wadamin." Whoever does who pretends to be a doctor and he and he causes injury to somebody, he's not actually a doctor. Then he's actually responsible for that. And the same thing applies in da'wah and fiqh and all this kind of fatwa and all that kind of stuff. Because why not? At the end of the day, if you don't do it with ihsan, if everything is haphazard and whatever, then you are also, if people go astray, if people are misguided, then you are held account. So ihsan is something that the religion of Islam very clearly, and that's why I know we put it in his 40 hadith, because it's one of those things which are very clear, important things the religion of Islam uh, mentions. Greatness of soul, he mentioned which is effectively being high-minded, or the idea of not being affi afflicted by travesty. And we know the very famous hadith of uh, that the Prophet ﷺ is advising everyone that if, if difficulty befalls you, then you have to be patient. If difficulty, if good things happen to you, you have to be patient, uh, thankful. And if difficulty befalls you, you have to be patient and thankful. But if you think about the Prophet's life himself, and we'll come to this maybe... In what follows but just this thing alone like all of his children died except for one tell me of a bigger travesty that you can imagine happening to a human being i mean i cannot imagine something worse happening to another human being if you've if you've got children you know what i'm talking about there's nothing more difficult than you can imagine than losing your child there's nothing more all of his children except for fatima radiallahu anha all of them died he had to go through the pain that many times and his wife and his uncle. Yeah, in one year, and his yeah. wife and his really uncle. Close, yeah, exactly. Exactly, the year of sorrow and stuff. And how did he handle that? The child, your spouse is how did he handle that? The fact that he handled that with grace and with patience and that that was documented, wallahi, it shows this man is practicing exactly what he preaches. And it's very important uh, also to note that there was a very interesting and famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ going to the graveyard and there was a woman wailing and stuff like that because she had lost her son. And then that particular woman, she started saying, you know, I don't, you don't know what I went through, and you don't know what, whatever. He walked away, and then they told her, that's the Prophet of Allah. And then she went back to him, and, and what he said to her is very powerful. He said, that as sabra the sadmat al-ula. Certainly patience is upon the first calamity. So it has, see, look, these Aristotelian principles, you can see how Islam is actually much more advanced in telling us how you can implement them. Al-Ihsan is telling us where and when to implement Ihsan, more importantly. When it comes to high-mindedness or so-called magnificence, Islam is telling us, actually, how can you sh implement patience and high-mindedness at the highest level when you first get str struck with the calamity? That's where the most pain is. That is when you're going to be, that is when the test really is. And the Prophet Sallallahu he went through all of those tests and he passed all of those tests in front of the people. And that shows you, it shows you resolve, it shows you depth of character, and it shows you that he's not, he is practicing exactly what he preaches. And that's something that if you're a fraud, you'd be completely exposed. If you're doing these kinds of things, and then your children die and stuff like that, but you didn't have what you claim to have, patience and high-mindedness and stuff like that, then you would, you would crumble at, at that. Screaming and, oh, how can my kids and bring the people around me? And the, do you know what I mean? If he didn't have those characteristics, then how, how would somebody who doesn't have those characteristics uh, be respond to five children dying, his wife dying, his uh, uncles dying, so many people in, in jihad dying as well, his uh, close relatives? He always picked himself up and continued. The, we would the never incident be... Of as well. The incident of Taif. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? 
which we're going to cover in more detail, of course, as well. Gentleness and kindness. Now, we'll, I'll mention some hadiths on this uh, separately because I think it, yani, it requires a special treatment. But that's another thing that he mentions. Truthfulness about yourself, self, self-accountability. There is something called the psychology of delusion. I'm not sure if you've come across it. There's actually studies done on the psychology of delusion. And in the psychology of delusion, you'll find that most researchers, they, ra- they, they, they define delusion as someone actually having false beliefs. And they differentiate b- delusion with what is referred to as highly valued ideas. So you can have a highly valued ideas, but delusion is different. And it's so shocking, because if you look at all of the definitions of delusion, the transgender movement it effectively fulfills all of them. Because if you think about it, look, uh, one of the main delusions is, uh, for example, schizophrenia. Like, that is, in terms of the mental disorders that somebody can have, what is a schizophrenic person? Someone who sees things that are not there. They're hallucinating. I'm not sure if you've ever engaged with someone who's schizophrenic. But the, the schizophrenic person is it's one of the hardest things to deal with. They're g- given drugs and just kind of anti- what's referred to as antipsychotics. Yeah, because when you're in a psychotic state, you're seeing things that are not there. And this doesn't... And let, I mean, there are some things called episodes. Episodes. But one thing which characterizes schizophrenic episodes or what is, bipolar episodes, manic episodes, with a psych- uh, psychotic... Uh, uh, with a psychotic uh, character is that they don't always happen they're not they're not coherent so for example if you're not because someone will say he's majnoon as we'll come we'll come to this right because what is the uh, uh, when you're when you're insane and you're majnoon, if you're majnoon that is effectively you're psychotic what is the definition of psychosis according to the dsm rich the dsm being the the main thing that the psychologists use as the definition of psychosis is some this is the standard definition someone who's lost touch with reality definition okay so let, let's propose that somebody has schizophrenic episodes or or let's say for example bipolar episodes or whatever it may be and they and they have these manic episodes and they, and they become psychotic okay so i'm writing down whatever they see when they're psychotic the schizophrenic person or the bipolar person or whatever it may be is it consistent it's not usually consistent let alone coherent so, for example, like if you take a hallucinogen, right? If I got some mushrooms, and I give it to you guys, right? <laughs> and I think for the for the Dao, we have to do this experiment. <laughs> I mean, we have, there's only one way you can find out, you know. <laughs> I mean, me telling you is not the same as you trying it, is it? So, if I give like everyone here like a ma- magic mushroom or something like that, right? Or on, uh, what's it called? LEDs, right? Or, uh, LSD. LSD. Sorry, LSD. 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 In other words, the first thing you saw, the second thing you saw, the third thing you saw, like, put it this way, let's say you have a dream. Today you have a dream, right? What is the chances that you have a dream every day and it's like episodes to a Netflix series? In other words, everything is connected to the next dream. There may be a human being that has that kind of experience, but that experience is rare if not non-existent. In other words, you, every, every time you go to sleep, I'm going to sleep now, and you have a dream and it's like episode one. And then before the, 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 next, the next dream you have is like, what do, you, what do you call it? It's like uh, the last, the last episode of this, <laughs> of your dream. This happened, and then the next, next, next. What I'm saying is that if you're delu- there's two claims that you have to make when you say the Prophet is deluded and Majnun. His delusion has to be consistent, like his hallucinations have to be consistent and tell a story. But we don't know that of mental health disorders like that. We don't know that if you take hallucinogens like that. We don't know that of dreams. So they would have to be they would have to be imposing a kind of delusion which is extremely rare, if not impossible, we haven't even seen in the human condition. Do you see what I'm trying to say? But when you look at the psychology of delusion, delusion is basically when, when the thing that you say happened can be falsified. Which is why they differentiate it, by the way, but there's a differentiation between delusion and highly valued ideas. Because highly valued ideas are like religious ideas. There's no way of disproving heaven and hell. I mean, obviously, famously, Richard Dawkins wrote the God Delusion, he wrote it. But you can't call that a delusion psychologically because I have to call that highly valued ideas. These are highly valued ideas. 
even according to psychological literature. They're not delusions because they don't, if they're all delusions, all delusions people would have to be in the mental hospital. Uh, like, 80% uh, of the world population should have been in a mental hospital. They should all take antipsychotics. And Richard Dawkins and his atheist friends, 2% of the population of strident atheists, according to Linda Woodhead, would be the only ones not taking anti. In fact, everyone should take antipsychotics. Majority of people should be taking antipsychotics, according to that. So we know how to differentiate between highly valued ideas and delusions. This is the point I'm making to you. And highly valued ideas are different to delusions because in the case of the latter, they can be falsified. So when a transgender says, I'm XY and he's XX, that can be falsified on an empirical level. That's delusion now. You're the same as the psychotic. You're the same as the schizophrenic. Because you are saying something which I can falsify. Do you, do you see the point? You, I can falsify what you're saying. Whereas the religious person, he's, he is believing in something referred to as a highly valued idea. So the idea that Prophet is deluded. There's no, there's no evidence that his temperament or his disposition or that his behavior is the, the behavior of a deluded man. When did he, do you know when you suffer a psychotic episode? You swear, you scream, you do this. You, you don't, you, I mean, if you've seen it, especially if it's, if, what would you have? What, what, what bipolar? You think if you have a bipolar, it's the only thing you're going to do, be psychotic, and that's it. Psychosis is, is rarely ever in a vacuum. Psychosis usually happens in an array of different things happening at the same time. So they clearly don't know mental health. Uh, quite frankly, they, I mean, we're living in an age of mental health where mental health can be seen as somewhat of a religion, and yet they don't even know about that. So to call him deluded, he's not. And in fact, you can see a deluded person can be, obviously in, in the virtue sense, overconfident of their own ability to a level which is unprobable, to a level which is completely unprobable. But every single one of the calculations of the Prophet Muhammad has, has, has produced positive results. So in other words, if he was deluded, then how could his delusion <laughs> produce that level of positive results? Because the Sunnah Kauniya, we know that you cannot actually get somewhere without putting in the work. And we'll come to Badr, for example, where the Prophet ﷺ, right before Badr, he was making dua to Allah. So much so that Abu Bakr Siddiq had to tell him, like, you know, don't need to continue making dua like this. Yeah, and he, Allah will listen. Uh, yeah, and he, he didn't say that, but he said, like, yeah, and he, he's trying to... But if he, if he was overconfident in his ability, he would make a dua like that. He put it in Allah's hand. For example, you didn't throw when you threw, but Allah threw. So his behavior is not somebody, he would make strategic decisions. It wasn't, let's just go haphazard and this and that. If that's the case, then why didn't history see every leader as a deluded person and uh, these should be the top uh, leaders that have the best results? Yeah. What about the, the phraseology or when people say you, know, you have to be deluded to be successful and stuff like this, like big entrepreneurs, big innovators, they're deluded. How do you unpackage that from, from that? No, no, it's, fake it until you make it. Yeah, fake yeah. it until you make it. Fake it until you make it is that phraseology, you cannot fake it until you make it in certain fields. It's impossible. Okay, fake it until you make it. Go to and do a mathematics exam and see how good you are. Fake it. You've done no maths and you go and do like a top level mathematics exam. Let's fake it until you make it. Let's see what can happen. Not going to fake it until you make it. It's like a boxing match. match. So, okay, fake, fake it until you make it a boxing match. Yeah, yeah. you'll see everyone you has a plan until you get punched in the face. You can fake it until you get punched. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so fake it until you make it. You've seen that. Like, for example, these guys that were going to Deontay Wilder and it knocks him out and this is the troll and this and that. It's yeah, humiliation. Yeah, yeah. That's the only way to get these people to understand. Deluded yeah. people need help. And sometimes delusion is not psychological like that. Sometimes the person over is actually overconfident with their be be ability. But that process has never showed that. Is what I'm trying to say. His temperament wasn't like that. It was very measured. Everything he's, you will see as we go through the seal that that was the case. Obviously, one of those is equity, which is like adl and so on, being being just and equitable and fair. We'll come through that and forgiveness. And there's lots of examples of, of that. Uh, Mecca, Fatah Mecca, and uh, Wahshi, and all of them Sahih Hadith. And obviously, someone could say, well, the well, Fatah Mecca, Idhabu uh, Fa'antum al this particular when he said leave uh, your, your particular phraseology some Islamic anti-Islamic apologists say that this is daif this hadith even if we say it's daif no problem it's daif even uh, Albani says daif no problem that hadith is daif but still there's other hadith which say that whoever goes دَخَلَ دَارْ أَبِي سُفْيَانْ فَهُوَ آمِنْ for example this is a hadith of uh, Bukhari whoever goes into the dar the, of Abu Sufyan he's safe which means that 
that particular hadith is not, is not needed. And we know for a fact, we don't even need that hadith, we don't even need any of the hadith, because we know for a fact that that happened. That Prophet Muhammad Hassan forgave Mecca. They will say, well, what about these people that he assassinated and this and that. Every single name that you can bring, and we can come to this and we will come to this, they had either been physical, attacked the Prophet Muhammad's daughters, a lot of them actually attacked, them. one of them killed the, you know, the, 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 the baby, or they uh, tried to kill the Prophet himself, or they were trying to kill the Muslims, or they were a threat, an existential, or they were, they were a, a real military threat. And how come there's a few of them only? So we'll come to that. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't cancel the forgiving gesture that Prophet Sallam uh, put forward. And we'll come to that. And modesty, which is something the current age, we, subhanAllah, we don't have much of, frankly. And what is modesty? Is refraining from shameful and lewd behavior. And we've come to that. I already spoke about the Prophet Sallam. And by the way, modesty is something praised in Islam. And it was praised by Aristotle. You'll see that a lot of the stuff nowadays, we're living in a shameful age. And that is because modesty is not emphasized as a virtue anymore. There's a book written by someone called Alisdar McIntyre. And it's called Archer Vir uh, After Virtues. Okay, it's seen as one of the most important books in moral philosophy in the last hundred years. The guy who used to uh, work in London Metropolitan University, he wrote this book and it was about, he, he's basically saying now we're in liberal age and things have gone worse after the time of Aristotle and stuff like that. And he mentions Aristotle and if you look at chapter 12 and chapter 14 of the book, he describes the virtue ethics of Aristotle and stuff like that. But what I'm saying is that you can see why a lot of the things that are happening today are happening because we don't have this was a more developed even though it was 2400 years ago and it was in the west it was more developed than what they have now in the west now uh, another point which is interesting is that a lot of these things can be argued on consequentialist grounds and deontological grounds remember we said that there are three things in the western tradition there's deontological ethics there's virtue ethics and there's consequentialist ethics right there are three things virtue ethics is what we're talking about now but you can actually say that the virtue ethics although they're not prescriptive a lot of them you can say, well, if people were not courageous, you'd have these consequences, negative. If people were not modest, you'd have these consequences, negative. So in other words, a lot of the virtues can be said to be, you can argue for them on a consequentialist level. It's better to have people in the world who are courageous, who are modest, who are whatever, on consequentialist reasoning, even on deontological reasoning. So that, in many ways, shows you the power of the virtue ethics, because it enjoys widespread Support. Having said that, there are criticisms that we can bring to the table, but we'll come to that in a second. What Aristotle does <clears throat> is he says, look, you've got two extremes and then you have the middle ground, right? So I'll give you ex some examples. He says, you've got, you've got rashness. You've got rashness, someone who's reckless, effectively someone who's reckless, right? And then you have someone who's a coward. And in the middle, you have someone who's brave. So... The virtue is somewhere in the middle. That's what he's, what he's saying. So you have someone, well, this is the word, licentiousness, okay? That's what well, someone can't control their sexual desire. Remember, I was saying the irascible and the licentious, yeah? Someone who's having, he's an addict, a sex addict. He has sex evidence of any woman he sees, like Russell Brand used to be back in the day, sorry to say. And he, it's not virtuous. It's not virtuous. I mean, you, I'm not talking about his allegations, but if you're going to have sex with a thousand women, and then you come back and you talk about the consequences. Fra frankly, I'm sorry to say, this is bad behavior. It's not virtuous. You should, someone should have told you this is unvirtuous behavior. So this is licentiousness. And he's, you know, doing this and doing that. This is licentiousness. So you have licentiousness on the one hand. And indulgence. And then you, and then you have insensibility. Which means this guy don't even, he has no vigor. For example, doesn't want to have sex with his wife. He's at home, he's every day, he's sleeping on the couch, he's sleeping on the... This is what I would rather be a sex addict. <laughs> no, I, no, but obviously not halal. But I, yeah, not doing zina. But I'm, I'm just saying, like you know, that's worse because then you're taking the hack away. At least with this one, you're taking, you're, you're harming yourself, but you're not harming the woman. And likewise, if you're the same thing as a woman, like you know, what I'm saying, so long as you're not doing haram. The point is, is that this is deficiency. And I'd rather be rash than a coward. I know that sounds bad. Usually, I would, I would put to you that a lot of the excesses are better than the deficiencies. Because deficiencies render you closer to being a dead man than being alive. But the excesses are something you can refine. I'll put to you that. Uh, you know, anyway. The next thing is uh, prodigality and meanness or liberality. Oh, sorry, uh, 
So this we talked about this, like uh, not being stingy, not being. We talked about the, the middle ground, vulgarity, yeah, and pettiness, and then you got you know magnificence, this high mindedness that we spoke about. Oh, look at this one, pusillanimity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, and vanity. Okay, then you have the middle ground, which is uh, magnanimity, right? So, and it goes on and on and on. But the, the point is irascibility, lack of anger, this and that. And the, the point is, is he also mentions, next slide, he, he also mentions some intellectual stuff. You have to be intelligent, this and that. Uh, wise, have understanding, and all these kind of things. The thing is, we, we, we as Muslims see it as a different way. Yes, it's true that if you have more knowledge, Allah raises you in levels when it comes to Islamic knowledge because it's the knowledge of guidance. Allah says that in the Quran. Allah who raises in degrees those who have been given knowledge, among, those who have believed in being given knowledge among you. Surah Al-Mujadala, chapter 58 of the Quran, right? However, having said that, we don't consider you to be more virtuous only by having more intelligence because that is intelligence is really seen as a gift from Allah like in a sense that it depends on your opportunities in life like if you're good at certain things now it is a virtue in one sense but in another sense it's really to do with where you live and what opportunities you were given whereas a lot of the other things it doesn't matter where you live so long as you're interacting with humans you have an equal opportunity with everyone else to try and be that thing so in other words you can be humble for example you can be humble wherever you are in whatever part of the world you still have that test and you can be a very virtuous person without having the opportunities of the elites. So a lot of the discourse of Aristotle and the virtue ethics, you can see it moves or leans towards a kind of elitist discourse. So the more clever you are, the better you are. Then you can see, okay, the snobbery will come in and the inequality will come in and this and that and thinking you're better than other human beings because you're more knowledgeable than them. And you can see where it can come in. Having said that, this idea of eudaimonia coming from when you're virtuous, we would say, no, it's not just when you're that. You have to have a meaning in life and a purpose. And the, what better purpose? And the only purpose you can have is the purpose of life, which is to worship Allah. So being virtuous by itself is not virtuous. The only way to be virtuous is to believe in Allah. So, you know, iman and then amal salih. You, by, by just having amal salih without iman, it's haba' and manthura, in fact. It's not good enough. Because you're doing it to what end? And to what goal? And to what objective? And for what reason? Meaningless. It's meaningless. So you ha being good is only good if you're doing it for a reason. And it, it, we don't believe in just doing good things frivolously or capriciously. We believe that it has to be done for the ultimate goal and objective in life, which is to believe in Allah. And if you think about something else, and I've been thinking about this myself. What is the ultimate, for example, let's just take one uh, thing. What is the ultimate level of uh, ingratitude? Because ingratitude seems a vice by everyone. If you're ungrateful, it's vice. The, the most, the worst kind of ingratitude is ingratitude towards the creator. So you can be virtuous to all the creation, to all the human beings, but if you're ungrateful to the creator, then that would tip the balance towards ingratitude, that you're bad, in fact, rather than good. You're not virtuous. What's the worst kind of cowardice? The worst, worst kind of cowardice is not to ask yourself why you're on this planet and what you're doing here, and to come to the conclusion that actually we're created and so on. You, all of these virtues and vices can be directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because if you're not showing it to the khalq, to the creator, then, uh, the, the khalq, then showing it to the khalq is not, is, is not going to compensate for that, unfortunately, because of the, 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 the loss that you're... So if you don't have iman, if you don't have the belief in God, God, then, uh, then it's, all, it's all a waste of time. And obviously, as we know, goodness is, we believe, is good linked to God, and that He's al bir, al bar. He is the goodness. So everything good comes from good, from from the good, which is Allah. Now, having said that, we have our own tradition, and it's interesting that Al Ghazali is probably. I'm saying this as a matter of opinion, but I, you could argue. But his book on this, Hay al Muddin, which we have a copy of there, if you want to read it. But Hay al Muddin is probably the best thing that was produced in this regard, where you're talking about the ver in Islam, probably. Because he compartmentalizes, he defines it, he gives examples, he gives hadith. Now we know that you know a lot of the uh, hadith there are weak. Uh, we, we've spoken about that at length and stuff like that. Which which tabar sheikh would you uh, recommend, which doesn't have the weak hadith? There are a couple of summaries. Yeah. For example, Ibn Jawzi has a, a book called Ibn Hajj al Qasidin, Fakhtisar mm. and then came along Ibn Qudama, another figure not Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi, yeah. uh, who authored Al Mughni. The well-known humble scholar, another 
So he summarized what uh, Ibn al-Jawzi produced. So we have the summary of Minhaj al-Qasidin. And uh, for example, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi has a book called Mu'idat al Actually, it's another summary. So, is there anything which gets rid of all of that? Because we know there's weak hadith in there. And what, what happened? Uh, there is a well-known figure, Al Hafiz Al Iraqi. He has actually uh, a book, fi uh, Takhrij, uh, mentioning uh, just commenting on the hadith that are within Hiya Al Muddin, who is the one who is the one who is the uh, yeah, he's just proposing a title that you, 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 through this book you will not need to uh, bring other books in order to uh, identify the weak narrations and the accepted narrations within Ihya al muddin So usually the majority of the editions that are produced of Ihya al they just uh, mention the comments of, of, uh, of Al-Hafz al-Iraqi upon those hadith. Mm. But the problem, the best edition, I would say, who the edition that was produced through Al-Minhaj, Dar Al-Minhaj. But the problem with that edition, especially, they didn't include what Al-Hafz Al-Iraqi uh, wrote. Mm. So we have a good edition on every front other than the issue of Hadith. And the majority of other editions are, um, are not the best editions in conversion with that edition, but at least it contains uh, Iraq's book on the matter. Mm. Well, that's for the Arabic readers. I mean, the English, yeah. unfortunately, we don't have any of that stuff translated into yeah. English, but it's, uh, there's going to be a lot of people that will be watching that and stuff and, and trying to get these editions. So that's, uh, thank you for that. Certainly, it's been translated, this book has it's been translated into English, but when you're reading it in English language, beware that the hadith are problematic. There's a lot of weak hadith in there and stuff like that. So you'd have to do your work, homework, and see which ones are not, and literally underline them and see what, what's going on. Nevertheless, it's probably the best in terms of the spiritual, psycho-spiritual aspect of the human being. Like, for example, uh, to give you a, a bit of a taste of some of the things, obviously the book is, is in, divided into four different, it's called quadroons, so quarters, yeah? And the third and fourth quadroon are effectively about, you know, vices and virtues, in a way. Virtue, uh, in a way, it's, it's things that will destroy you, al-muhlikat and al-munjiyat, which are things which will save you. But really what they are, vices and virtues. I mean, the first and second book were about transaction. The first was about worship, and then the second was about transaction. And then about munjiyat and, uh, and, and muhlikat. But this is, so this is the third and fourth quadrune. I'll give you an example. Condemnation of rancor and envy. See, Aristotle doesn't really emphasize that as much as a vice, as, as much as uh, rancor and envy. Do you see what I mean? Like al-hasad, al-hiqd and al-hasad, for example. Uh, then you have miserliness, or we know, stinginess, right? And he does. Condemnation of the love of wealth. So loving the dunya too much and stuff like that. There's a book there. Uh, pride and conceit. Pride is kibr and conceit is effectively ajub. So he puts them both together. Ajub is self-grandiosity or self-amazement or self-aggrandization, whatever it may be, right? And it's breaking the two desires which we talked about already, the, the sexual and the anger. These have all been translated. I think Abdul Hakim Murad is the one who translated that one, Timothy Winters. But it's been these have been translated into English language. It shows you like brings the hadith together of what the Prophet ﷺ said and stuff like that. And I'm only bringing this to your attention to show you the Islamic resources on the matter. And this is probably the most important one. Obviously, we can talk about other resources. The fourth quadrant, as you can see, on patience and thankfulness. Because what it tells you is effectively what we're trying to do is show you what the mistakes could be that you're making. You could be you could be a jealous man. You could be an envious person. You could be an angry person. You could be someone who can't control your desires. That's your problems. Okay, so what are the solutions? Get rid of that. Expunge yourself from this. Like, you know, if you've got rubbish in it, if you've got some contaminant in this particular uh, bottle of water, then you remove a takhliya and a tahliya, as the people of Tazkia mentioned. Uh, you remove the, the impediments and then you try and put the good in there. So you to remove the, expunge yourself from the bad. And then to add on to that, patience and thankfulness, fear and hope, you know, repentance, uh, Sincerity and truth and so on and so forth. So uh, having said that, I want to just take a couple of, I know it's, uh, how long have we, okay, we're all right, yeah, we're okay. We'll, go, we'll do a little bit, uh, a couple of uh, case studies, we're near the end, don't worry, tail, tail end of the discussion. But uh, I wanted to take a couple of case studies of the Prophet Muhammad uh, some of his um, virtues, 
okay, and, and just spend some time with them. I know we have already done that to some extent, but just maybe just to emphasize the point a little bit more. So we said courage. Now, what is courage? And Muhammad Muqayyim Jawziyah says, It's a very, very good definition, actually. He says, courage is when you, your heart is firm when the calamity strikes. That's what his definition. Another definition, and some people have differentiated courage between military courage, physical courage, and moral courage. Yeah, He says, this guy called Matthew P Penalto, he says, moral courage includes acting in the service of one's conviction in spite of the risk of retaliation or punishment. Aristotle says that the sphere of action or feeling excess moral uh, so it's, it's as we said, it's, it's between the two. It's crashness and recklessness on the one hand, and, ca and cowardice. So courage is in the middle. Yeah. This guy Put Putnam. I don't know who he, I don't know who he is, but I found him. He says that um, high levels of fear than a a coward is somebody, right? Who, who would experience high levels of fear than a situation calls for, and lower levels of confidence. I don't agree with this, by the way. I agree more with Customato. Who is actually? Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but he's the he's the trainer of yeah. who is he the trainer of Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, right? And listen to what he says. Very powerful. It's one of the best quotes in courage I've seen. He says the hero and the coward both feel the same thing, but the hero uses his fear, projects it into his opponents, while the coward runs. It's the same thing, fear, but it's what you do with it that matters. It's not about feeling fear. Like this guy Putnam, he's an academic. He probably has no idea about this situation. I don't know why he's even writing about it. He should be ashamed of himself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Someone who's never engaged in any kind of uh, confrontation is talking about courage and stuff like that in a theoretical manner. But really, what what courage is, and I think Customato is right, it's not about feeling fear. Because you can't control that. If, someone, if, if a lion comes in, and we're all jumping on tables. If a dog comes in, they're all jumping on tables. You know what I'm saying? Like a vicious dog. It's not about feeling fear. It's about what you do with the fear. It's about how you act despite feeling that fear. So a, a courageous person, he feels the fear, but he... He, just like he was able to, for example, a person who's temperant is able to control his sexual desires, even when it's it, it's calling for you or your your, your anger. The, the courageous person is very similar to that person in so much as that they can control their fear. Effectively, courage is about controlling fear. That's all it is. It's not about eliminating it. It's about controlling it. Just like temperance is about controlling sexual desire. You can't eliminate it. It's about controlling it. It's about what you do despite feeling that f emotion. And uh, I'm only bringing this to your attention because we're going to look at some hadith. Okay, so like for example, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu right? So this is, what, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is a hadith in Bukhari. He says that إِذَا اشْتَدَّ الْبَأْسِ Yeah? And then وَلَقَ الْقَوْمُ الْقَوْمُ And then... Uh, if 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 the two parties meet in battlefield, yeah, and the situation gets heated in the battlefield, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam he says, Mayakun Edna uh Mayakun Minna Ahadun Edna min al minhu that there's nobody closer to the other side than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is for me that is uh, crystal clear. If there's two groups fighting and he's putting himself at the front line. That's it. What can you say? This, there's no better, there is no better test of courage. There is no better. No one can say, that man is a coward. What are you talking about? So, so much so in the Battle of Hunain, and this is another hadith that I've put there as well. In the Battle of Hunain, okay. Okay. Uh, when the, when the, 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 the companions were, were seeing that they had failed, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the battlefield and calling them back, saying, Ana Nabiyu la kathib, ana Abdul Muttalib. I am the true prophet, no lie, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. So he's saying, come back to fight. So he's fighting. He's telling them to come. So it shows you level, courage has levels. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was at the top level of courage. Unfortunately, we're not even going to be able to, it's a virtue we can't even test in the modern age. Which shows you that, subhanAllah, we have not been chosen for this. We have not been chosen to nurture that virtue because we don't have the opportunities that they had. Our best opportunity is in sports. And some, some a, a moral courage, as the guy was talking about, saying the right thing. We're, we're, our levels of courage as men in the modern age can never even be tested at the level that these guys were, were engaged in. No way. 
So what I'm saying is, and even in sports, so there's a hadith, and there's a hadith of Rukana. Now I came across this a weak hadith. Okay, it's a weak hadith. However, Ibn Kathir says, is a jayid. Sanad. I came across the Ibn Kathir. He says uh, he says that the, the Sanad is actually like jayids. Okay, it's not that bad. And I know there's a, there's one particular hadith which Albani also makes Hassan. Anyway, the hadith is that it's, this guy was a champion wrestler. We're talking about champion wrestlers, and Muhammad Sallam engaged with him in wrestling. Which shows you that he, because courage is context specific. Courage is context specific. So if you can do it in the battlefield, it doesn't necessarily you can. It's conceivable that you can be great on the battlefield. But when it comes to public speaking, you find it scary. In fact, the surveys that have been done that shows that people that are more scared of public speaking, for example. But the Prophet Sallam done both. He went on the mountain of Safa, and uh, and he's saying, if I were to tell you that I was such and such, would you believe me? That there was an army on the other side, would you believe me? He, they said, yes, we believe you. Imagine going in front of your whole town and making an announcement like that. So now that requires a kind of confidence and courage when it comes to the public speaking realm. But also, he's in the battlefield, in the front lines. That shows you that his courage was across all categories. So that's a virtue you cannot deny the Prophet Muhammad for example. I'm giving you, and then and then in sports, this, I mean, imagine it—you got the champion wrestler, undefeated, undisputed, yeah, and then and then the Prophet Hassan beats him in the wrestling match. Puts his yeah, I've never, my back has never reached a hit the the ground like that. So he, he's engaging in sports, he's engaging in uh, he's running this that, fighting, public speaking, he's putting himself out there. And if you're a person who didn't believe in your own ability and you didn't believe Allah was helping you. You th you're making it all up. You wouldn't have that courage. Where would it come from? Where would the courage come from? His courage came from tawakkul, from reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very important... I was talking with the Shaykh about this hadith. I put it there as well. And uh, it's a very powerful hadith about the sincerity of the Prophet Muhammad sallam. Because we also now have to ask the question, what about sincerity? Because sincerity is one of the virtues as well, right? As, as I mentioned, Ghazali has a book on sincerity and intention and so on. And this is very powerful because what it is, is that after the Isra al Maraj happened, and this hadith is Sahih, yeah? I saw it, it's narrations in Ahmed, Muslim Ahmed, but it's, it's a Sahih hadith. That after the Isra al Maraj, how you guys know the, the night's journey and stuff like that, the Prophet ﷺ was hazinan, was actually very sad about the situation. And it was like, why, why are you so sad about the situation? It's because he knew that people would not believe it. Mm. Abu Jahl came and he knew. This is very interesting. Because what, think about it. If, if you're a fraud, why would you want to say something which the people are not going to believe? You're trying to bring people to your religion. Why are you saying something which you know the people are going to believe? That shows you sincerity. And then Abu Jahl came along and says, go and tell the people. Go and tell the people. And then he went and told the people because he had the moral courage. As we were talking about moral courage. And it, if something is true, it's true. And also he was the true prophet and that was obligatory upon him. He went and told the people and some of them were putting their hands on their head like that. Some of them were clapping. Some of them were, and then, and then that. They were shocked. Some of them left Islam. This what the, so what I'm saying to you is, why would, he do, why would he say something of his own volition that had the net effect of letting some people leave Islam such that the enemies of Islam would rejoice at it because he had to say it because it was part of the deen because he had... And it shows you has moral courage and sincerity. The fact that his temperament was hazin and he's sad this is a very, very powerful hadith to that effect. And then you have more. For example, and this is a famous one, but I'll just mention it anyway. When his son died and the sun and the moon eclipsed and he, he could have used that and he could be opportunistic and he didn't. But it also shows he's not delusional. Because we know that's sincerity. We, we can all make the argument. This shows you sincerity. It's not opportunistic and all that kind of stuff. We can also say, well, he, well, he could have been delusional. If he was a true delusional person, why well, say, yeah, that, that happened. It's because of my son. Yeah, of course it is. It also strikes out the delusional card as well. So when you look at the Prophet Sallam Sira, it, sh it shows you sincerity, lack of delusion. And we talked about the Safa uh, hadith and this uh, is, is there as well. And so look, he, his khuluq or his virtues were being attested to by the closest people to him. So for example, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha, she says, never, Allah, never will Allah disgrace you. You keep good relations with your kith and kin. Tell the truth, help the poor and the destitute. Serve your guests generously and assist the deserving calamity afflicted ones. He had the track record of this thing. He was known as a sadiq al-amin. He had the track record of being 
sincere in that way. And there's lots of hadith on uh, modesty and humility, which we can uh, which we can cover. But because I'm cognizant of the time, <laughs> because I'm cognizant of the time, I will cover some of the hadith anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just mention some of them, right? <laughs> it's it's more than that long. Two forty eight. Um, so I just want to mention some of the hadith here about uh, about this because this is really powerful. Wallahi, like the Prophet Sallam's the mattress on which the Prophet Sallam uh, used to sleep on consists of tan hides and stuffed with fibers. He wasn't living the luxurious lifestyle, even though money was coming in from the state and stuff like that. This is how he chose to live on tan fibers. A woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a Sahih Muslim as well, and said to him, I am in need of you. So he said, sit in whatever road you wish to, uh, of the city you wish and I shall sit with you. Which also destroys this idea that, you know, there was this, such a strict gender relations that the men were in one place and there were barriers. And he said, now sit there and I'll sit and speak to you. But look, he considered speaking to this woman to be like, she wasn't, oh, I'm the leader, what are you are talking about? Like, you know, this, no, he actually, this was... Genuine, he went and sat with her, he considered her needs to be important needs. And this is a woman, so it's, for those who say that Islam discriminates against women, doesn't care about them, obviously we know that Prophet Islam had a day where he used to teach just women on, on Thursdays. It's mentioned in Bukhari as well, actually. But this shows you that even the individual woman who had her concerns, the Prophet Islam would go and try and meet those concerns. We, we, um, Allah's Messenger. So for example, another hadith here. I haven't checked the authenticity of this one, so I'm not going to mention it, actually. Uh, these other ones here, usually the rule of thumb is in Bukhari, it's usually sahih, unless it's mu'allaq and has some big discussion about it, which I'm, I haven't seen. So let me quickly, this is a very interesting hadith. We were told by Ishaq ibn Musa, on the authority of well, blah, 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 and Amr ibn al-As, that Allah's messenger, so I him, used to speak directly with the worst people, thereby winning their hearts. He used to do the same with me. So I thought I was the best of people. I said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better or Abu Bakr? He said, Abu Bakr. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better or Umar? He said, No, Umar is. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better or Uthman? He said, No, Uthman is. Whenever uh, I asked the Messenger of Allah, he told me the truth. So I wished not to <laughs> not ask him. But the point is, is that he thought, uh, I must. He, the way the Prophet was dealing with him, he thought I was the man. I was the man. He must love me the most. But then he had to tell him the truth because he had the moral courage and it was also part of the religion. And uh, so there's many, many hadiths like that. Um, look at this one, for example. Allah's messenger never struck anything with his hand unless he was struggling in the cause of Allah, nor did he ever strike a servant or a woman, which, which already dispels so many of these myths that we've heard from these uh, disbelievers who are uh, antithetical to Islam. Uh... Can I add one? Yeah, sure. Actually, there's... Uh, so, you know, we were talking about his children and so on and so forth. And Fatima, radiallahu anh, was his fine, the, the only one that was living. Yeah. <coughs> and you as a father, and there may be people here that have children, the love to your child can sometimes make you make decisions yes. that are not in line with your values, maybe. Yeah. You see? So, um, there was a time where Fatima radiallahu an was working so hard to the extent where her mm. hands were getting like cracked and yeah, all yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. And she asked for one of the slaves mm. so that they can help, mm. help her. Mm -hmm. And what did he reply? He said, mm. don't you see the people? I, I forgot exactly what it was, but... He told us to do Tasbih 33, SubhanAllah, 33, yeah. Allah, 33 Allah, Akbar, and, and so why didn't he make it easier for yeah, them? Yeah, and he reject. to be honest, he rejected, yeah, he rejected the request, that, uh, the, the request and mm. what happened. So if you think of this guy who has, who, who was a liar or a scammer, would he lie and put his daughter exactly. in a very difficult situation? Exactly, exactly. Like, do you see? Was that Fatima yeah. or Aisha? Or was there Fatima, Aisha? Fatima, yeah. Mm. Was there another one with Aisha, his wife, when she asked for... I don't know, extra slave or something like that. No, was that was Fatima, yeah. Fatima. Was mm. Aisha? Yeah. yeah, well, that's absolutely a good point. I mean, um, I yeah, wanted to mention... When, yeah, father. Fatima, radiallahu anha, whenever she entered to the room, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yeah. would stand up, kiss her, and sit out mm. in his place. Mm. So that's a respectful woman and children. 
And the fact that he rejects it after being, you know, such a loving father mm. shows how much he was dedicated to this path himself. And all his family and friends were suffering as a, as a result. Beautiful. I think I want to mention a couple more things here as well, uh, because sometimes when we think of the Prophet we think of him in a very unrelatable manner. Like we've, we've tried to create some level of relatableness uh, in, in, in mentioning, for example, that his children died. They had this, this grief in his life, he had the difficulty in his life, and he was courageous, and he had impeccable moral virtue. Or in the Kala'ala Khuluq and Azim, as Allah says in the Quran about him, that you are, have impeccable virtue. But we don't see him as a person who smiles and is laughing and happy and these kind of things. And if you look, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, he was referred to as someone who smiles. Like, I'll give you, give you some hadith on this, because I think it's very important as well, right? He was a person that is joyful. He, was, he, was, he had a positive demeanor. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't, just, it wasn't negative or morose. And this is very important, because nowadays we're living in an age. It's called Bashash. Bashash from Washington. Yeah, so like, for, for, for example, I, I'll mention you here. Like, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu would not speak... Uh, so this is about the speaking. That's oh, about the kalam. Sorry, but I can mention that as well. He would not speak on and uh, on the way you do. Rather, he would pause periodically, and he, so he was very stoic, and he would only speak when necessary, right? And this in Bukhari, he would not. He, this is Aisha mentioning. He wouldn't speak the way you do. So notice the trend of the Aisha. She'd always <laughs> compare, like you know, you guys, you're not control of yourself like he was. You know, he wouldn't speak like you guys. You're always speaking for no reason. <laughs> but he would just speak, you know, when it was required. For example, and he sat there and he paused periodically and. It, he wasn't, he had Joama al Kalim, as we know. He had, he had um, the, 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 the kind of um, comprehensive speech. Look at this one. There was a slenderness in the legs of the Prophet, and his laugh always took the form of a joyful smile. So when I looked at him, I said, His eyes are blackened with kohl, though he is not black eyed. Yeah? Look at this one, for example. The, laugh, the laughter of the Prophet was nothing but a joyful smile. There's a lot of these hadiths talking about him smiling. He was a positive, uh, he had this, this kind of positive behavior. And this one is there, it's Bukhari, this one I should mention. Uh, Allah's Messenger وسلم, did not shun me from uh, the time I embraced Islam. And this is Abdullah, who is this? Jarir ibn Abdul, uh, Abdullah? Jarir ibn Abdullah. Uh, sorry, Abdul, uh, yeah. Jarir ibn Abdullah, right? He said that Allah's Messenger did not shun me from the time I, when I embraced Islam and he never saw... I never saw, uh, and he never saw me without laughing. So he was laughing. But obviously the laugh wasn't like a, you know, like our laugh. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, was well, too loud and stuff like that. He wasn't interested in that. There's only a few hadiths where you see him as like, you can see his molar teeth and these kind of things. He was more smiling, you know, periodically and stuff like that. It shows you he was a very positive character. He was in control of himself. He was positive. He was helpful. He was kind. I want to mention a few more hadiths. I know it's, uh, you know, I don't know how many have been talking oh, for some. two hours. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll just mention some other hadith. Look at this, about the generosity of the Prophet Muhammad So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a time when, this is in Bukhari, but, oh, sorry, Muslim, that he, there was a herd of sheep that filled the whole valley. And there was a Bedouin there that aspired for the sheep in the valley. So he asked, him for, he asked the Prophet Muhammad and he gave him all the sheep. He just gave them the sheep. Actually, like if, you, if you're really on this whole material stuff, you're not going to give everyone, like you've got all these ships that fill the giant valley, he said, give it to the man. He, the man was so impressed by that, he returned to his people and he said, oh people, embrace Islam by Allah, gives in charity as he does not fear poverty, he doesn't care. He, get, he, was, he was shocked at the generosity. This guy became Muslim just based on the generosity of the Prophet The Prophet used to give wealth to new Muslims in order to reconcile their hearts. Uh, so that's one thing. And listen, this is a hadith of his, of the Prophet Do you know, for example, uh, Al Abbas, he gave him a lot of money in the Ghazwa. And he said, uh, do, not f do you fear that I have become stingy by Allah? If you share, if you share camels, where as many as trees in, in Tihama, yeah? I would distribute it among you. You would neither f find me stingy nor a coward nor a liar. Because these three things are connected, by the way. Yeah, yeah, and you'll find that people who are cowardly are usually stingy as well. That's usually a connection because you fear something. Actually, one guy fears he gets pain, and the other guy fears poverty. If you you'll find that the bravest people you've ever met are also the most generous. That's usually a rule of thumb. And and they speak the truth because they don't fear anybody. They just speak it. They're, no problem, unless it's a strategy of war or something like that. Right? 
Now this is a very powerful one, right? An incident that indicates the generosity is the hadith of Anas ibn Malik. Money was brought to the Prophet ﷺ from Bahrain and he ordered that it be dispersed in the mosque. Although it was the largest amount of money that the Prophet ﷺ has ever received, he went out for prayer and did not even turn to it. Yeah. After finishing the prayer, he sat by the money and gave some to every person he, he saw. He did not get up un, until the last coin had been distributed. Bukhari hadith. If this guy, if, subhanAllah, if this man وسلم, was trying to get money, then why didn't you take it? It's right in front of him. He was distributing it and sleeping on the farm fibers. Humble lifestyle. Money was coming in, but he was distributing it to people. He was using it for, for, for the state and all this kind of stuff. While I was walking with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was, this is in Bukhari Muslim, who was wearing a Najrani garment with a thick hem, a Bedouin came up to him and he pulled his garment so violently that I could see the marks on his shoulder caused by that violent pull. And obviously he had the, the seal of the Prophet, is something we didn't mention in the physical description, he had the seal of the Prophet, he has a seal between his two shoulder caps, which is some coloration, some colors, it's like, in the, it's like a dove, it's like a mark, yeah, but it's like, a, it's like the uh, egg of a dove, for example. Then the Bedouin said, Order uh, for me the fortune of Allah, the Almighty, which you have. The Prophet ﷺ turned to him and smiled and ordered some wealth be given to him. Doesn't faze him at all. Smart, take the money, no problem. And this is just one thing. We could talk about the kindness of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, we have all day. I'm only joking, I'm only kidding. I know you guys are. Look, for example, the Prophet Muhammad, I mean, think about it, right? He was kind and gentle to the animals, to the human beings. Uh, t for example, there is a hadith that says, Fear Allah in the treatment of animals in Abu Dawood. Verily, there is a heavenly reward for every act kindness done to a living animal, Allah uh, Prophet says. And, uh, and there's so many things like that which we can, we, we can point to. The neighbor, the animal, and all these kinds of things. Okay, I think I think that's enough for one day. But I just wanted to give you a taste. And well, uh, I've got lots. Of, I've got a collection of hadith. I can. I've read only a few. But this shows just gives you a flavor, a taste of the characters and the virtues of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which we would say not only magnificent but beautiful, aesthetically beautiful, objectively so, in fact. And this is in itself an argument for the veracity of Islam. And this is the second session where we're talking about the virtues of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi We only gave you a taster of that. In the next session, inshallah, we'll get straight into the thick of it. And we'll be talking more in a narrative manner and going through the hadith and so on. I hope this interdisciplinary approach has been useful to you. Because it has been for me in preparation for this particular session. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.